Kentaro Mira first premiered Berserk in 1988 with a non-canonical story called Berserk, the Prototype. Mira produced his 48-page story in his college days and subsequently won a prize at his manga school. The following year, the series officially kicked off with the Black Swordsman arc. It would only gain in popularity from there on. Due to the acclaim of the Golden Age arc, Berserk was adapted into a 25-episode anime series in 1997. Though the series omitted large segments of the Golden Age story, it portrayed the characters beautifully and paid homage to all the key themes of the series. Years later, the Golden Age arc was adapted again, this time into a trilogy of theatrical anime films. Afterwards, the anime was revived in 2016 and 2017 with a 24-episode anime series. It's actually widely known that it's probably one of the worst anime ever produced. Now despite two anime series, three films, and a plethora of games, large segments of the Berserk epic were left untold, leaving many anime fans in the dark about the struggle of Guts, the Black Swordsman. Last year, I produced the Berserk timeline video to inspire the uninitiated to bathe themselves in the glory of Mira's grand tale. And now, I'm doing it again by expanding upon the Fantasia arc, adding the Berserk prototype, and cleaning up on some of my own airs to give you guys a more comprehensive look into Mira's extraordinary achievement. Like last time, I will present the events in chronological order, which means it will be different from the manga release. But with that said, let's start the Berserk tale once more. Journey. Around 1000 years ago, there was an era of conflict. Various tribes fought constantly in the midst of growing epidemics. All the while, the population was severely reduced until a man known as King Geyseric came along and united the surrounding countries to establish peace for the continent. Of course, with any kingdom, there are those who oppose the ruling order. One person in particular was a sage that Geyseric locked up in the Conviction Tower, where he was subjugated to every kind of torture known to man, until four or possibly five angels came to the rescue of the sage, and subsequently punished the bloodthirsty king by destroying his kingdom with lightning and earthquakes. It was the dreadful eclipse, an execrable event that happens every 216 years, in which a new member is added to the god hand. During the turmoil, the man who would eventually become the Skull Knight lost his supposed beloved and permanently became a dead man stalking the Endless Night. Roughly 1,000 years later, a baby is expelled from the uterus of a lynched woman and is left to wallow in a pool of amniotic fluid, mud, and blood. A group of bandit mercenaries led by a man named Gambino come upon the tree to witness the horror. Gambino's lover, Shizu, scurried to the puddle of afterbirth and claimed the baby as her own. Gambino reluctantly allowed his despondent lover to keep the child. Three years later, Guts would say goodbye to his adoptive mother after she contracted the plague. Three more years would then pass, and a six-year-old Guts was under the tutelage of Gambino in the ways of the sword and battle. After the talented lad sliced Gambino's face in a sparring match, the abrasive mercenary made a mental note of the incident, and after three more years, would accept payment from the vile Donovan to permit him to rape the nine-year-old Guts. Despite Guts' attempts at resistance, Donovan would eventually have his way with the swordsman. Preceding the loathsome event, Guts ambushed Donovan during a foray in the woods and used a crossbow and sword to bring down the repulsive pedophile. During the same skirmish, Gambino lost his right leg and was henceforth forced into retirement from the battlefield. Two years later, an 11-year-old Guts was flourishing in his role as a warrior mercenary and even killed an enemy general. Gambino, however, could not conceal his hauteur toward the young swordsman, and subsequently ambushed him in the middle of the night. It was then revealed that Donovan bought Guts from Gambino, sending Guts into a trembled shock. Guts clenched his sword and pierced it through Gambino's neck. Accused of murder, Guts stole a horse and fled the band of mercenaries he had been with since birth. But while escaping, a crossbow pierced his flesh, 
throwing him from the horse and leaving him to the wolves. Despite the improbable odds though, Guts fended off the ravenous wolves and subsequently collapsed onto the ground. A young boy, Serpico, takes care of his emaciated mother while being constantly bullied by other kids. After a severe beating, the youngest daughter of the Van de Mayen household, Farnese, tends to him and claims him as her own. Despite her family's wealth, her parents barely acknowledge her. That's where Serpico comes in. Farnese shows Serpico her crematory, where she burns all the quote-unquote bad ones. Serpico then recounts Farnese's penchant for burning people at the stake. One day, the Van de Mayen patriarch, Federico III, inspected Serpico's personal locket, and it was there that Serpico discovered that he was the illegitimate son of the wealthy nobleman, meaning that him and Farnese were half-siblings. Roughly three years after killing Gambino in self-defense, we find a teenage Guts bounded up in a chain gang after fighting in a losing battle. After stumbling down, Guts is whipped. Martino, one of the older prisoners, helps Guts and claims that it's by God's good grace that they're still alive. Guts stumbles again, but Martino catches him this time. The boy pulls back, making it clear that he doesn't want to be touched. Guts stumbles again and hits the ground this time. Martino covers up Guts when one of the guards attempts to whip him. The older man looks to carry Guts from here on out, to ensure he doesn't die. After finding out that Guts is a wandering mercenary, Martino wishes that one day he can eventually find a mercenary band of friends that he would be willing to sacrifice his life for. Makes you wonder if Martino knew about the Band of the Hawk. Martino notices an unfinished castle off in the distance and determines that they'll be the new laborers. He then picks Guts' locks and urges the boy to escape. Guts promises to pay him back one day as he makes his escape. Martino slips out of his own locks and uses Guts' distraction to escape on a nearby cliff. Guts then remembers when he was on the front lines under Gambino's orders. These soldiers served as the bait for the enemy, so that the more experienced mercenaries could survive and destroy the enemy. When it comes to ambition or survival, many people will do despicable things. Therefore, it is always better to look out for oneself than others. Guts awakes in a prison cell, chained up to a nearby wall. The boy scolds himself for falling for Martino's cliched trick. Guts eats a rat for sustenance and covers himself up with some hay. He then stares at a lone flower inside the cell. A young, magical girl then comes into his field of vision. Guts wonders if this is a hallucination or the real thing. The guards and the nobleman enter his cell. The nobleman inspects Guts' body and asks if his wounds are healed. Guts spits in his face. The guards beat him down, but the nobleman orders them to stop. He then applies medicine to Guts' wounds. The nobleman explains that Guts will fight his son in battle. However, Guts is to die at the nobleman's son's hands. The nobleman then leaves, offering no food to Guts. As the boy falls asleep, the cryptic fairy begins to approach him again. After making him sneeze, she hides behind the flower. She approaches Guts once more, introducing herself as Cheech. She got this name because she heard a rat make a noise like that. And she is the spirit of the spring blossom flower. Guts introduces himself in kind. Since Guts killed the rat, she wants to offer him thanks. Unfortunately, she can't break him out. But she does collect water for him and warms him up with her powers. She then plucks a leaf off of the flower and places it on Guts' wound. Guts asks her to heal his other wounds, and the small elf complies. Cheech explains that all the other prisoners left, and she fears that Guts will leave her too. Cheech is lonely inside the cell. Her only enjoyment comes from the sun, from which she derives her power. He plucks her off and says he saw a field of flowers just like hers off in the distance. He promises to bring her there when he escapes. Cheech happily plucks more leaves to heal Guts' wounds. After sleeping for the night, Guts realizes his fever is gone. He looks for Cheech, but notices that the flower has wilted. The cell door is then opened by the guards, so Guts grabs Cheech's flower and tucks it away as he leaves for the battle. Guts is henceforth given armor to wear for the battle. He is led to an arena where he meets the nobleman's son, who's rather large. Guts is given a dull sword as the fight commences. The nobleman's son strikes first, with Guts defending. Guts is still in a weakened state due to his hunger, and henceforth is sent flying back. He stands up and verifies that he still has Cheech's flower. Guts dodges the next attack as his opponent's mace gets stuck. Guts strikes, but his dull sword is ineffective. The nobleman's son resumes attacking as Guts struggles to deal significant damage. 
Guts remembers a battle tactic that he learned from Gambino in dealing with larger opponents. He utilizes the advice to dislocate the boy's arm and pierce his eye with the cross guard of his sword. Guts then takes the boy hostage. The nobleman advises his guards not to attack, but one of the guards fires his crossbow. A random gust of wind dislodges Cheech's flower, and when Guts goes to catch it, he inadvertently evades the arrow. A large force of mercenaries burst into the castle and kill the nobleman's soldiers. Martino then approaches Guts. Oh there, boy. You're still alive. It's you. You allowed me to notify the main force of the castle's location. Thanks for that. Guts is seething with rage. Due to the fact that Martino double-crossed him, Guts says that this makes them even, as he finds Cheech's flower on the ground, trampled by one of the horses. Nevertheless, Guts returns to the field as promised, to lay Cheech down to her final resting ground. It is uncertain whether it was reality or dream. That was so long ago, when he was just a boy. The buried memory of an early spring day. Around the same time, give or take a few years, Griffith fosters the Band of the Hawk and saves Casca from being raped by a man of nobility. After killing the vile man, Casca joins the Band of the Hawk and embraces the soldier life. As their notoriety spreads throughout the land, Griffith and the Band of the Hawk accepted work from Lord Genin and the Tudor army. But to acquire money, Griffith was forced to spend a night with the perverted nobleman. The war funds acquired, though, would increase Griffith's chance of acquiring his own kingdom. A great dream, after all, requires great sacrifices. Fast forward one year, and the tenacious Guts defeats the menacing Bazuzo, catching the eye of the captivated hawk. After collecting his war spoils, Guts harshly declines an official role in the army, and ventures off on his own. Afterward, the Band of the Hawk notices Guts walking by himself and decides to ambush him on horseback. Guts makes quick work of the men until Casca shoots him with a crossbow and gives Guts a competitive battle with the sword. After knocking Casca down and preparing for the kill, a spear flies in to halt the swordsman from his fatal blow. Griffith proceeds to subdue Guts with relative ease and decides to take him into their camp and warm him up with Casca's body. Upon waking up and walking around a bit, Casca punches Guts in a sensitive area. Griffith then brings Guts to a hill to have a conversation about joining the Band of the Hawk. After much disagreement, the two decide to settle things with swords, and after Griffith demonstrates his clear superiority in swordplay and hand-to-hand -hand combat, Guts reluctantly joins the Band of the Hawk. While recuperating from his wounds, a handful of the Band of the Hawk soldiers look to attack Guts in his weakened state. But Casca intervenes before anything happens. During a night mission, Griffith gives Guts the most important job, the rear guard, showing Griffith's trust in Guts' abilities. The mission proceeds smoothly until the enemy cavalry catch up to Guts, putting him in peril, especially after he falls off his horse. But Griffith comes to the rescue, allowing him to escape through the forest as they blast the enemy with cannon fire. The next morning, Guts sees Griffith taking a shower, and they begin to splash each other. Eh, you know, in a non-homo sort of way. Guts then notices the behalot on Griffith's neck, which is called the Egg of the King. And whoever possesses the behalot will tame the world in exchange for his flesh and blood. Griffith then tells Guts, I will get my own kingdom. You will fight for my cause, because you belong to me. In the next battle, Guts charges in by himself and earns the respect of his fellow comrades, all except for Casca, that is, who excoriates Guts for breaking rank file and endangering the entire mission. Tensions continue to boil until Griffith intervenes. Afterwards, Griffith attains the rank of knighthood, which is unheard of for a commoner. The preceding battle goes well for the most part, until they hear a rumor that Nosferatu Zod has been recruited by the enemy. As the legend goes, the savage warrior has killed for hundreds of years and is considered immortal. Guts, unfazed by the lone man who guards the castle, enters in to fight the demonic creature. 
Guts does well to stop Zod's sword, which hasn't been done in 50 years, but is completely outmatched by the legendary warrior. Despite this, however, Guts is thrilled by the challenge of fighting the strongest warrior he's known. Guts does well to drive a sword in Zod's body, but this only causes Zod to transform into a demonic beast. As Guts struggles to stay alive, Griffith and his men intervene, but this only angers Zod further. Griffith and Guts then combine their talents to inflict more pain on the immortal Zod. But it isn't long before Zod takes control once again. After approaching Griffith, Zod notices the behalot on his neck and displays a look of unequivocal dread. Zod then gives Guts a prophecy. If you can be said to be a true friend of this man, then take heed. When his ambition collapses, death will pay you a visit. A death you can never escape. The Band of the Hawk arrive in Windham, the royal capital of Midland, to rest up. After infuriating Casca to no end, she punches Guts in the face. Before he can respond, he notices tears coming from Casca's face. Guts then leaves and swings his sword for a bit to cool off. Griffith then intrudes, and the two begin to contemplate the idea of gods, devils, and Zod. The King of Midland then interjects and offers his gratitude to Griffith for his devout service. Princess Charlotte, the king's only daughter, carelessly trips over a stone, but is caught by Griffith just before she injures herself. General Julius, the king's brother, smacks Griffith for touching the princess, to which Griffith promptly apologizes. Minister Foss then alerts Julius to the fact that the Band of the Hawk will accompany the king on his autumn hunt, angering Julius profoundly. Foss then floats an idea about a stray arrow with poison accidentally hitting Griffith during the upcoming hunt, pleasing Julius immensely. As Griffith is making small talk with Charlotte during the hunt, a wild boar scares the princess's horse, leading her to a small pond where Griffith's assassin patiently waits. After saving Charlotte, the poisonous arrow pierces Griffith's armor. Luckily though, it hit the behalet without touching his skin. After taking note of the strong poison and meeting Julius's gaze, Griffith begins to formulate his own machinations, one in which Griffith asks Guts to kill Julius, who is second in line to the throne. After secretly watching Julius train his son, Adonis, in the way of the sword, Guts is reminded of his time with Gambino and begins to have reservations about the assassination plot. Guts goes through with it anyway though, killing Julius rather easily. But when a door creaks open, Guts lunges forward and kills Adonis as well. Guts proceeds to fight his way through the castle, and after reaching a point of pure exhaustion, passes out in an underground channel. After returning to the Hawk, battered and bruised, Guts goes to Griffith, who is having a conversation with Charlotte. Much is said during the conversation, but the most important part comes when Griffith says, What I think a friend is, is one who is my equal, sending a shockwave into Guts' soul. With Julius gone, the Band of the Hawk becomes the kingdom's vanguard, and as such, Griffith assumes a prominent position. Foss then contemplates eliminating Griffith in the future, but when he notices that Griffith has been staring him down, he experiences an inescapable dread. Before departing, Charlotte hands Griffith a good luck necklace to take into battle. Charlotte's mother, the Queen, castigates Charlotte for associating with Griffith, a man of humble birth. In the preceding battle, Casca comes face to face with a Don of the Blue Whale Knights, and ends up in some trouble before Guts comes to her aid. Guts takes care of business, but because Casca was experiencing stomach pains, for unknown reasons, she passes out and falls off a ledge as Guts comes to her rescue. After resuscitating Casca, Guts drags her inside of a tree, as a torrential downpour was not letting up. Guts quickly realizes, though, that the female warrior would die of hypothermia if he didn't strip her clothes off and warm her body up with his own heat. Guts then realizes that Casca's stomach pain was coming from her monthly period. Upon waking up, Guts makes crude remarks about Casca being a woman, receiving the female swordsman's scorn. 
Casca then reaccounts the past events that were discussed earlier, with her joining the Band of the Hawk. Guts then realizes that the enemy is closing in on their position, and tells Casca that they leave by nightfall. Unfortunately, they don't make it far before being surrounded by the Blue Whale Knights. After denying Adon's deal, Guts and Casca make their final stand. Adon eventually calls upon a towering man named Samson, who initially gives Guts some trouble, before he has his head sliced open. Guts instructs Casca to take this moment to escape and return to her swordmaster, Griffiths. Guts begins to slice and dice the horde of adversaries as Casca gets captured. Luckily, she defends herself long enough before the Band of the Hawk intervenes. But there's no time for leisure, as Casca leads her comrades to Guts, who just finished killing 100 men by himself. Upon returning to camp, Casca receives elf dust from Judo to heal Guts' wounds. While applying the dust, Guts and Casca talk about the light of fire personifying one's dream, and how Griffith has combined those tiny fires into one blazing inferno. Guts also hints at the idea of leaving the Band of the Hawk. Afterwards, Griffith finds himself in a meeting with the Midland Generals and the King about seizing the Tudor Army's stronghold, Doldry Castle. Griffith volunteers the Band of the Hawk for the mission of taking the stronghold via fighting the Purple Rhino Knights. Meanwhile, at Doldry Castle, Lord Gennon requests that Bascon, the leader of the Purple Rhino Knights, to capture Griffith, alive and unharmed. During the climactic battle, it seems the two opposing forces are evenly matched, but Griffith decides to retreat his men. Bascon, though, seems content with yielding to this move, but Lord Gennon demands that they capture the White Hawk, so they recklessly send all their men in pursuit of the Band of the Hawk. While the Purple Rhino Knights are distracted, Casca and a fleet of men burst through the Doldry Barrier to seize the castle. However, to take the castle, Casca must defeat a Don. Meanwhile, the Band of the Hawk has re-engaged with the Purple Rhino Knights, and Guts finds himself paired up against the formidable Bascon. In the midst of the battle, Guts' sword breaks, and it looks like it's all over, until Nosferatuzad chucks a sword from a nearby cliff to Guts' position. Guts grabs the sword and chops off the head of Bascon, while Casca takes down a Don. With the capture of the castle and the death of their leader, the Band of the Hawk completed their mission, and to cap things off, Griffith expelled Lord Gennon from his mortal existence. However, before Zod leaves the scene, he claims, The Eclipse will soon come. Afterwards, Foss, the Queen, and other cloaked figures plot their revenge on Griffith for killing Julius. Griffith and the Band of the Hawk return to Midland to a celebratory parade. But during the proceedings, Foss reads a distressing note and begins to panic. A celebratory ball is held for the Band of the Hawk's accomplishment, and the King declares that each member of the Hawk will be knighted, and that Griffith would become the White Phoenix General. During the King's toast, Griffith took a sip from his chalice and collapsed onto the floor. While celebrating their accomplishment of killing Griffith, the Queen and her accomplices noticed some smoke coming from the creeks of the floor. After finding out the room was locked, an explosive fire engulfed them, leaving them to burn alive in their own grave. Griffith, who faked his own death, watched the affair from a safe distance and claimed, Those who die on the battlefield are not royalty, nobility, or commoners. They are the defeated who die. Afterwards, it is revealed that Griffith used Foss' allegiance to the Queen to arrange the eventual betrayal. He did so by kidnapping Foss' daughter, Elise, who he promptly returned after the Queen's death. To tie up loose ends, Guts killed the men who kidnapped the minister's daughter, as instructed by Griffith. Several days later, a royal funeral was held for the Queen. A month afterwards, Guts collected his belongings and prepared himself for a new adventure, without the Band of the Hawk. Casca caught up to Guts and delayed him long enough for Corcus and Judo to take Guts to a bar and talk things over a bit. Although much is said, Guts' central message is that he wants to be on equal footing with Griffith, via searching for his own dream and purpose in life. 
Upon leaving, Judo has a one-on-one -on -one talk with Guts, and even floats the idea of pursuing Casca. Guts, shocked by this statement, claims that Griffith and Casca are meant to be. But Judo reveals that Griffith must marry Charlotte if he is ever to attain his own kingdom. As day breaks, Guts runs into Griffith and the other prominent members of the Hawk. After Guts makes his intentions known, Griffith draws his sword and claims, I thought I told you then, that you belong to me. Griffith and Guts prepare for their monumental battle, each man allowing a million thoughts to race through their mind. Yet, Guts seems more placid than the normally serene Griffith. Meanwhile, Casca is torn between who she wants to win. Griffith plays out scenarios in his head of how he will defeat Guts, and determines that if he was to kill him, it's better than not having him in his service at all. With a drop of some snow, Griffith lunges towards Guts, fully intending to kill the swordsman. But it is to no avail, as Guts' powerful swing chips Griffith's sword, flinging the point of the blade in another direction. Guts, henceforth, is the winner. Casca desperately pleads with Guts to stay. Nevertheless, the swordsman is firm in his resolve, and doesn't so much as glance back at her or his other companions. Under the moonlight, Guts reminisces about his time with the Band of the Hawk. That is, until an ominous spirit, resembling Nosferatu Zod, approaches his position, and lashes his sword towards Guts. After evading the strike, the figure comes into focus. It is a man, or specter of a man, who divulges a mysterious premonition about an event that will occur in one year's time, the Eclipse. During the same time, Griffith appears at Charlotte's window, and uses the opportunity to gift her a night she would not soon forget. Unfortunately, one of Charlotte's handmaids saw the lustful behavior through a keyhole, and reported the findings to the king's royal guard. Griffith, henceforth, was captured. The king wasted no time in flogging Griffith in the torture chambers. Unfazed by the physical pain, Griffith insinuates that the king wishes to have Charlotte for himself, enraging the king to no end. Yet, it turns out that Griffith's accusation was true, revealing the king to be a bona fide pervert. Afterward, the Band of the Hawk is tasked with an erroneous mission to lure them into a compromised position. Meanwhile, Griffith continues being tortured by a deformed man. The man inspects Griffith's behalot, but accidentally drops it into the sewer. Meanwhile, Guts is staying with a blacksmith, Godo, and his daughter. It's a pivotal period in which Guts learns more about himself and his purpose in life. Roughly a year later, an arms tournament is being held, in which we meet Salat, a Kushan warrior. Despite his slender appearance, Salat makes quick work of his hulking opponent. Next up on the docket is Guts, but he is not thrilled by his said opponent. So he proposes that him and Salat duel one another. Salat's quick maneuvers surprise Guts at first, but it's not long before he demonstrates his clear superiority. Afterwards, Guts finds out that Casca is now the leader of the Band of the Hawk, leaving him in a state of enraged confusion. We learn that Casca has been in charge of the Band of the Hawk for a year now, and is beginning to show signs of mental and physical fatigue. After getting ambushed by Salat and his men, Guts intrudes upon the proceedings, and re-engages Salat for another battle. Salat does well to prove his mettle, but Guts ultimately proves too much for the crafty warrior. After the Hawk rejoices in Guts' return, they get Guts up to speed with all the events over the past year, and inform him that their sole mission is to rescue Griffith. Casca inadvertently asks Guts to have a discussion, not with words though, but with the sword. After Casca misses several times, she yells, Griffith's no good without you, and subsequently pierces Guts. Casca bemoans what became of the hawk, and how her dream died the day Guts left Griffith's side. She collapses near a cliff, but Guts hastily grabs her arm in the nick of time, and throws her to safety. In the throes of all the emotional turmoil and vulnerability, Casca lowers her barriers, and allows Guts to embrace her in a surprising display of love. 
Consequently, as Guts assumes a certain position, he is reminded of the night that Donovan raped him, and without thinking, he places his hands around Casca's neck. Guts then divulges his heinous past and his regrets for killing his foster father, Gambino. Casca calms the swordsman down by giving him emotional reassurance, something Guts has rarely experienced in his life. Guts lets Casca know that he will aid them in saving Griffith, but will part ways thereafter. Henceforth claiming, from now on, every battle will be my own. After a brief dispute by the fated lovers, Guts declares his intentions of being with Casca for the foreseeable future. While hallucinating in his torture chamber, Griffith begins to see four mysterious figures shrouded in darkness, who say, We shall meet. We are kinsmen. O oh, blessed king of longing. Casca leads an expedition to Windham to rescue Griffith. During the night, they enter an underground passage that leads to a mausoleum. There they meet Charlotte, who guides them through the labyrinth that is the castle. While walking, Charlotte tells Casca that Griffith was in the chamber the night he got caught by the handmaid. They arrive at the Tower of Rebirth, where Griffith is being kept, and Judo floats the idea of taking Charlotte as a hostage. Charlotte, listening in, volunteers herself as a hostage. Despite reservations, Casca eventually accepts Charlotte as a hostage. After Judo takes out the guards, the Hawk enters the Tower of Rebirth. Meanwhile, back at camp, Rickard notices an elf in the night sky. Hastily, he returns to camp, only to find blazing fires and a horde of monsters. The specter that warned Guts of the Eclipse one year prior comes to Rickard's aid and wards off the fearsome monsters. While Rickard sobs in fear, the specter leaps into the night as if he never existed at all. While descending down the Tower of Rebirth, Charlotte recounts the story of King Geyseric that was discussed at the beginning of this video. And Guts remarks, Sounds kind of like Griffith. At the bottom of the tower, unbeknownst to the members of the Hawk, are the remains of Geyseric's kingdom and a slew of skulls with an ominous mark on their foreheads. The Hawk arrives at Griffith's chamber, only to find the former leader in a wretched state. Guts opens Griffith's helmet, only to be horrified by what he sees. Then, as Griffith notices Guts, he puts his hands around the swordsman's neck, as if to choke him. Something Judo picks up on, but no one else really does. But Guts, overcome with emotion, embraces Griffith in a hug. But this reunion takes a turn when the deformed man locks the cell door. Guts asks if the deranged man tortured Griffith, and when the man admits to his misconduct, Guts drives his sword through the door and into the heart of the deformed prison guard. An arrow comes down to warn Guts and his comrades to stand down, but Guts goes berserk and slaughters his way through every last guard, leaving nothing but blood and entrails in his wake. The king witnesses the remains of the battle, bemoans losing his precious Charlotte, and instructs the guards to summon the Bakiraka, a group of five highly skilled assassins who barely resemble men at all. While escaping the sewer, the hawk runs into the Bakiraka, and while one blows a dart toward Griffith, Charlotte shields him with her own body but passes out in the process. The Bakuraka offer to take Charlotte off their hands and give her the necessary antidote to the poison in the dart. Charlotte denies and the band of the hawk fight the Bakuraka under the instruction of Judo. After they take out some of the members, a blazing fire comes down the sewer, forcing the hawk to run. After some quick thinking by Pippin, the hawk escapes the Bakuraka. After the king is disappointed and dispatches the Bakiraka, he decides to send out Wyald and the Black Dog Knights. A glimpse five years in the past shows Wyald to be a ruthless animal-like man that took charge of a criminal warrior group called the Black Dog Knights. Such was their callous nature that they would violate women and butcher children. And now they were after the Band of the Hawk. After raping and mutilating a village of civilians, the dogs were rapidly closing in on the hawk. Guts and Pippin slashed through the weaker soldiers, but Wyald stepped in and caught Guts' hand in mid-swing. 
Up ahead, Casca rigs a bridge with explosives, while Guts becomes ominously aware of how strong Wyald truly is, comparing him to Zod and the Skull Knight. After the bridge blows up, Wyald walks through unscathed. As the hawk continues to run away, Guts contemplates the Skull Knight's words from one year ago. Wyald continues to plow through each trap the hawk sets, until Guts declares one-on-one -on -one combat with the animal-like man. Wyald easily blocks each of Guts' swift attacks, even catching his blade in his mouth. While this continues to go on, Casca and the Hawk take control of the battle with the Black Dog Knights. Wyald, unfazed by this loss, punches a tree down on his own men. Wyald then transforms into a demonic beast, much like Zod, and puts Guts down for the count. Wyald proceeds to obliterate every soldier in sight, while Casca attempts to wake Guts up. Wyald seizes the opportunity to grab Casca, strip her down, and slide his tongue dick around her body, until Guts slices that chubby clean off. Guts begins his final assault on Wyald, even though he is trembling in ways he's never trembled. Despite doing well to chop Wyald down and inflict damage, the hulking monster proves too robust for Guts. The injuries begin to take their toll on Guts, and apprehension begins to break his resolve. But a last-ditch tactic is tried, one in which Guts chokes Wyald with a sword and jabs a dagger into his eye. And it works. Casca sews up Guts' wounds and becomes distressed by his disregard for his well-being. Guts then has a one-side conversation with Griffith, and subsequently places Griffith's armor on his body. Wyald, who is supposed to be dead, is still hanging on by a thread. Upon entering the Hawks' camp, he grabs Griffith and urges him to summon them. The Great Ones are Guardian Angels. Wyal then strips Griffith's armor down to reveal the appalling state of his physical body. After wondering where Griffith's behalot is, Zod barges in and pitchforks Wyal with his horns and tears his body asunder. Zod tells Griffith that the behalot will return to his hand and promptly leaves. The Band of the Hawk is in a state of turmoil amidst the realization that Griffith's dream is dead. Casca goes to change Griffith's bandages, and while doing so, Griffith falls down on her. Seeing the trembled state that he is in, Casca can do nothing more than place a reassuring hand on his back. While contemplating his future, the Hawks members request that Guts lead them. Guts then talks to Casca, and she mentions how she can't leave Griffith in such a fragile state. But she urges Guts to push forward and attain his own dream. Listening in, Griffith sees a vision of the kingdom he so sorely desires. Using the last of his strength, Griffith takes the horse's reins and desperately pursues his dying dream. The carriage hits a rock, and Griffith is thrown into the air. A vision occurs where Griffith contemplates a fantasy marriage with Casca. Reality strikes back in the most cruel of fashions. To Griffith, suicide looks like a sweet blessing at this point. But he can't go through with it. It is then that Griffith finds the behalot in his hand. The hawk catches up to Griffith and sees a sight beyond words. Despite the ominous atmosphere, Guts rushes towards Griffith, and as soon as he touches his shoulder, the festival begins. The hawk begins to panic at the abject horror they are witnessing. The eclipse, as it were, is bringing terrible creatures to life. A gigantic naked woman with dark wings rises up. A fat-faced man with glasses smiles down at the hawk. A bald man who clenches his hands together keeps his mouth ajar in a most peculiar fashion. And a cloaked man with his entire brain exposed casts an impressive shadow over the entire proceedings. The four gods are here for the honorable child, the hawk. And the companions of the hawk are to be his sacrifice. So Griffith may become a demon. The time is now at hand for us to perform the Invocation of Doom. Griffith rises to the godly altar, attempting to take Guts with him. As Griffith comes face to face with the angels slash demons, he takes a step back into his own past. He quickly comes to a pile of dead bodies and realizes that they all died for his cause. To build the Crimson Bridge, 
to the desired kingdom. But many more bodies were needed to accomplish the goal. Apologize, repent, and say goodbye to the dream. Pile the corpses and chant, I sacrifice, and the dream will continue with raven black wings. Griffith accepts the proposition and admits that Guts was the only man to ever make him forget his dream. Each member of the Hawk is branded, and the festival begins its gruesome barrage of attacks. Guts learns that those marked with the brand of sacrifice will be hunted down incessantly until their agonizing death. Outside the eclipse, Rickard comes upon a whirlwind that is raining lightning, and in the distance, he sees Skull Knight and Zod fighting each other. Amid the battle, Zod barks at Skull Knight. You, who have been our foe for a millennium, I figured you wouldn't let this chance slip past. Zod and Skull Knight continue their battle as everything goes to hell inside the eclipse. Judo and Casca escape on a horse, but it isn't long before the monsters knock them down. Judo defends Casca with his body, while Casca makes her own attempts at fighting back. Due to severe blood loss, Judo can't impart his final message of love to Casca and ends up tumbling in stride. The monsters close in on Casca and begin to tear her clothes off. Guts ferociously fights off the endless barrage of monsters as Griffith begins to sink into another world. God? The mysterious swirling being announces itself as the idea of evil his essence coming into being because of the human need for reason. It weaves destiny through the lower levels of human consciousness, manipulating history for reasons that remain unknown. It concludes by stating, Do as you will, chosen one. Griffith then asks God for wings, to which he obliges. Guts continues fighting, losing control of his sanity in the process. Friend after friend perishes in front of his eyes, as the situation looks increasingly insurmountable. Then, Guts sees Casca completely naked and in the possession of a monster, and completely goes berserk. An ominous silence pauses the bloodshed, as the new member of the God Hand is officially born. The new Demon King, Femto, is born. Griffith slash Femto softly glides down to Guts's position, and he proceeds to grope Casca as Guts' rage is seething. Femto then violates Casca, while Guts attempts to chop off his own arm due to the fact that it is trapped in a monster's mouth. The scene ends with Guts completely losing it and screaming, Griffith! Femto continues his sordid display while Guts is forced to watch. As things reach their climax, Skull Knight bursts through the Eclipse Barrier and forcefully swings his sword toward the leader of the God Hand, Void. But due to a spatial distortion manifested by Void, Skull Knight ends up hitting himself. Skull Knight rushes down the gigantic hand and grabs Guts and Casca as he escapes the hell-like event. The God Hand then remarks that it is only the beginning of the Age of Darkness. Skull Knight tosses Guts and Casca toward Rickert and tells Zod they would postpone their battle. Zod, surprised by Guts' ability to survive the calamitous event, agrees to Skull Knight's terms as he's intrigued how Guts will survive in a world of darkness. After waking from a nightmare, Guts finds himself in a cave being taken care of by Rickert and Erica. When Guts sees Casca, he attempts to talk to her, but she resists, much like a child would, and even bites his hand in the process. Guts runs from the cave in a panic, thinking about his memories from the past years. After collapsing from exhaustion, Guts notices demon-like spirits in the grass. Skull Knight pops in and remarks, From now on, this is your world. The boundary between the mortal world and that of the dead, the interstice. Skull Knight hands Guts a sword, and Guts announces his declaration of war against the inhuman spirits, allowing his anger to consume him completely. After the spirits dissipate, Skull Knight warns Guts they found another light in the darkness, i.e. Casca. Guts and Skull Knight rush to Casca's position as they find her surrounded by demonic spirits. 
Casca clenches her abdominal region as a demonic child is expelled from her uterus. Per Skull Knight's advice, Guts clenches the demonic being with intent to kill, but Casca screams in horror. As day breaks, the child dissolves into nothingness, but Skull Knight says the child will persist and most likely return to its parents, i.e. Guts and Casca. Skull Knight then leaves Guts and wishes him the best of luck. Guts and Casca's troubles continue. Goto then fits Guts with a new prosthetic arm that has a cannon inside. Just then, a demonic beast arrives at Goto's doorstep. Guts' new sword is insufficient in cutting down the beast. But once he sees the Dragon Slayer, a massive sword that weighs hundreds of pounds, he slices the Apostle down the middle. Guts leaves Casca in the cave with Rickert as he sets off on his new adventure. Upon reaching the age of 16, Farnese's father arranges a marriage for his rebellious daughter. Farnese recommends that Serpico and her should run away together, but Serpico hesitates, leaving Farnese in a state of distress. To relieve her inner turmoil, Farnese sets the mansion ablaze and is later sent to a monastery to speak to God to temper her devilish tendencies. Farnese then assumes the role of the leader of the Holy Iron Chain Knights and takes pride in burning heretics. As it just so happens, Serpico's mother was also labeled a heretic. And because Serpico whispered mother while she was at the stake, and to avoid suspicion that he was also a heretic, Farnese took the torch, handed it in Serpico's hand, and they lit his mother ablaze together. Sometime afterward, the Holy Iron Chain Knights are going to the Red Lake, where the eclipse occurred one year ago. Farnese, the leader of the Iron Chain Knights, talks about the fifth angel, the Hawk of Darkness, who will usher in an Age of Darkness. Berserk the Prototype is not part of the official canon, yet it does serve as a precursor to the Berserk epic. This standalone story was submitted by Kentaro Mira in college as a student in 1988. Though certain details were omitted for the conical release, the core concepts are in line with what we see today. Now this story takes place after the Band of the Hawk story arc, which I would assume is probably the Golden Age arc, but they don't provide clarification. And it would suggest that it would have taken place between chapters 94 and 95, probably somewhere in the Black Swordsman arc prior to the Lost Children's chapters. Now, of course, it's not canon, so it doesn't actually exist, but based on all the evidence, it's kind of in that time range if it were to exist, if you know what I mean. And in a lot of ways, Berserk Prototype was Mira's rough draft for the inaugural arc of the series. And with that, guys, let's just have a small deviation from the story to explore Berserk the Prototype. A road is lined with impaled skeletons, as far as the eye can see. That's a little much for scarecrows, says Guts. Puck, terrified of the sight, hides in Guts' satchel. A group of bandits terrorize a young girl down the road. One of them threatens to skewer her, but then an arrow impales his brain. Arrows impale the other two, as it turns out, it was Guts who killed them. The black swordsman looks to raid the carriage for food, but he then slices a fourth thug straight through the torso. The girl then promises food to the black swordsman if he gives her a ride. Puck exits a satchel, charming the girl with his cute appearance. Due to his hunger pangs, Guts threatens to boil and eat the elf if he doesn't stop messing around. Frika, the girl, finds her uncle, as her parents and the other villagers celebrate her safe return. Frika's parents feed Guts, whilst telling him about the Fife Lord, Vlad Tepes. Over 10 years ago, Vlad Tepes took 500 enemy soldiers and impaled every last one of them, including women, children, and priests. Once wartime ceased, the Lord turned his malice towards his own people. Rumors have spread of him butchering young women. Four women have been chosen to be his maidservants, but none of them have returned. Good seems unconcerned, asking the mother for another drink. Other villagers enter the house, requesting Guts to kill the Lord for them. Guts laughs this off, calling the idea ludicrous. An old woman begs for him to avenge her granddaughter, but he quips with, I've got nothing to do with just and generous chivalry. I could care less. He calls himself a knight? Wonders Frika. Puck proceeds to berate Guts for his crass behavior. Frika apologizes to Guts, claiming that she told everyone that he was a powerful knight. I'm sorry, it's my fault. I don't really care. Knowing she'll be taken next, Frika asks for one of Guts' possessions. He thusly hands over his eye patch. Puck berates Guts for his insensitive behavior. My mother had her innards ripped out and eaten by them while she was still alive, says Guts. Killing them is all that keeps me going. I ain't got no life to spare for other people. 
As Fricka is taken away, Guts notices the crest on the carriage. And with this, the Lord has undivided attention. Fricka arrives at the Lord's castle. Inside, she is greeted by Vlad. The Lord inspects the girl's face with great intent. Fricka notices that his hands are cold and that his flesh is rotting. He's not human. An arrow impales Vlad's right eye. Wouldn't it be a good idea to skewer yourself now and then? I'd be happy to put an eye patch on you. Black Knight, says Fricka. Vlad pulls out the arrow, along with his eyeball. Guts fires an arrow in his mouth, but the Lord chomps it down. Guts accidentally springs a trap door, as various spears fly towards him. Though Guts has been impaled multiple times, he seems unconcerned. He pulls out the spear, whips out his sword, and says, I'm gonna mince you up, dog of Vuana. How do you know that name? The Lord of we who are not human. The most powerful god of the world. The name of the most ancient god of darkness, Vuana. Vlad then transforms into a hog bull apostle. Gut shows no fear, rushing in with a head of steam to confront the monster head on. Vlad catches Guts in midair, congratulating the Black Knight for making it this far. Guts merely smiles. Didn't I say I was gonna mince you up? Guts yanks on a string with his mouth, revealing a cannon within his mechanical arm. He blasts the apostle head on. And this finishes it! Though his guts and entrails lie scattered on the floor, Vlad manages to express his disbelief in what just transpired. Who else but a human would hate you bastards this much? Vlad notices the brand of sacrifice on Guts' chest, just before a boulder crushes his head and ends him permanently. Fricka is overcome with fear when she stares at the Black Knight. Guts returns to Fricka, stating he killed the Apostle for his own reasons and not to save her. Puck then thinks about how sinister Guts looked when he fought Vlad. I'll give them as much flesh and blood as they want. While I'm at it, I'll jam some steel in their heads. And with that, that ends the Berserk prototype, and now we're back to the main story. Guts arrives in a tavern and bloodies up some coca thugs. He tells one of the men to tell his boss, i.e. the Snake Baron, the Black Swordsman has come. Puck, an elf who was abused by the thugs, becomes an ally to the brooding swordsman. After being tortured and imprisoned by the mayor of Coca, who plans to hand Guts over to the Snake Baron, Guts gets healed by Puck and subsequently escapes his prison. Guts uses his prosthetic arm, which also serves as a revolving crossbow, to take down the Snake Baron's men. After Guts struggles a bit with the Snake Baron, he eventually takes control of the situation. He then asks the Snake Baron the whereabouts of the God Hand. And when he utters that he has no idea where the God Hand resides, Guts proceeds to abuse the snake-like apostle for his own amusement. After some disparaging words to Puck, Guts catches a ride with an old man and a young girl. Guts falls asleep and dreams of a labyrinth in which he's chased by Casca's deformed demon child. Guts shows them his brand of sacrifice mark on his neck and explains the evil spirits feed off of fear. The carriage stops and the girl gets out, only to be pierced by a sharp weapon. Guts then fights off a slew of possessed corpses. He then notices the girl's been possessed and kills the old man in the carriage. After taking care of business and surviving the night, Puck laments the death of the girl and the old man, while Guts laughs in a crazed manner. Guts arrives in a new land where heretics are getting their heads chopped off. After making his presence known to the Count, Guts is surrounded by ironclad warriors. However, they stand no chance against Guts' massive chunk of iron, otherwise known as the Dragon Slayer. Guts makes quick work of the towering man that is wielding a warhammer. It should be noted that Puck is meandering around Guts at this point as well. After escaping a smoke grenade, Guts ends up in the house of a mutilated man, Vargas, who claims the Count has cut off his body parts and ate them. Vargas then shows Guts a behalot that he stole from the Count. Apparently, the Count attained the behalot seven years ago resulting in a fascination with torture and eating people alive. Vargas, unfortunately, was forced to watch the Count eat his wife and sons. Guts explains that the Behalot is a key that summons demons from another dimension, the five members of the God Hand. In the meantime, the Count places a demon inside Zondark, the man with the Warhammer, and he thus uses his increased strength to smash through Vargas's house. Although putting up a better fight than last time, Guts easily dispatches Zondark, 
That is, until the parasitic count reveals himself. As the house begins to collapse, Guts, Puck, and Vargas escape through a secret passage. Guts claims the Behalot from Vargas, before parting ways with the deformed man. Immediately afterward, Vargas is caught by the parasitic count and is set to be beheaded. Puck urges Guts to save Vargas, but Guts displays no empathy. After the beheading, Guts sees the demon baby child once more, but this time with Vargas's face. Guts then vows he'll kill the Count for Vargas. The Count gives Puck as a gift to his daughter, Teresa, but bemoans the fact that she won't let him touch her. Guts enters the Count's castle and runs into Zondark once again. After regenerating several times, Guts cuts off the head of the parasitic creature and smashes it against a wall. Teresa tells Puck that Pagan sacrificed her mother to their god, and ever since then, the Count has relentlessly punished heretics. Guts slices through more guards before confronting the Count, who has some surprises up his sleeve. The Count transforms into his final form, and Guts learns the seriousness of his situation. The Count bruises and batters Guts to the point that the Black Swordsman displays a look of unparalleled dread. The blows take their toll on Guts, leaving him unable to defend himself. Puck notices the Behalet and attempts to keep it from the Count. The Count chases him down until he is seen by Teresa, who instinctively screams in horror. Guts enters the fray again and eventually uses Teresa as a shield. After blasting the Count and chopping off his head, Guts begins to torture the demonic beast in front of Puck and Teresa. The Count screams, I don't want to die! And the Behalet activates, causing a spatial distortion that is oddly reminiscent of an M.C. Escher piece of work. It is then that Guts notices the presence of the God Hand. Griffith! The Count pleads with Void, whom he calls Archangel, to kill the Black Swordsman, but they refuse, stating, His petty existence is beneath our notice. Guts attempts to attack his nemesis, Griffith, but the demon's mere presence causes him pain, as he is repelled backward. The God Hand then recount the events that led to the Count becoming an apostle. It turns out the Count's wife venerated the pagan god through sexual practices, and when he saw this, he sacrificed his wife to the God Hand to become an apostle. Now, to achieve his burning desire, killing the Black Swordsman, he would have to sacrifice his daughter, Teresa. The God Hand show the Count what hell looks like, and tell him he has two paths. To be reborn as a demon, or be absorbed by demon kind. The Count is tormented by the decision, but is unable to respond. The dead soul of Vargas, as well as others, drag the Count to hell. The spirits go for Guts next, as he shoots his cannon toward Griffith. After the departure of the God Hand, Teresa sobs for a bit, but eventually blames Guts for her misfortunes, provoking her to yell, I'll kill you! Thus provoking Guts to have a look of absolute sorrow on his face, something that surprises Puck immensely, and also creates one of the greatest memes of all time. Because you had a bad day, you take me one down, you save the sad Sometime after Guts saw the God Hand at the Count's castle, he saves a girl named Jill from being mutilated by some bandits. After a tree spirit scares the bandits, Guts has his turn, and despite some difficulties, he eventually takes down the evil spirits. Afterward, Jill sees Puck and begins to tremble, thinking he's an elf from the Misty Valley. Jill leads Guts and Puck to her village, where she gets abused by her drunkard father. The village folk see Puck and grab their weapons with killer's intent. After Guts destroys a cart, the village folk back down and Jill directs Guts to an abandoned windmill, where he will stay for the night. The next morning, Jill tells a cryptic story about elves killing livestock and carrying away children. Just then, the elves enter Jill's village, obliterating everything in sight. Upon seeing the pesky creatures, Guts uses his sword as a fly swatter. Guts then uses a small child as bait to lure the elves to a small barn where he blasts them to smithereens with his cannon. Guts encounters the Queen Elf, who appears to be an apostle due to his bleeding brand mark. After missing her with his sword, Puck notices that these are not elves at all, but children. 
the Queen Elf mysteriously calls Puck Pecaf, the outcast, and begins her assault. Until Jill calls her Rosine, and she mysteriously runs off. The burning elves turn back to children, and the townsfolk are enraged with Guts. Guts uses Jill as a hostage to escape the situation, and makes his way to the Misty Valley. He must rest up for the night though, and when the sun goes down, he sees the demon child in the fire, and numerous blazing children walking toward him. Guts wretches at the thought of killing children, and goes insane in the process of butchering them. After getting hurt and escaping with Jill, he inquires more info about Pecaf. Turns out Pecaf was a boy with pointy ears and a red nose, who was an outcast in his village. Apparently, he was healed by elves as a baby, and was permanently imprinted with their distinct physical characteristics. Jill remarks that Rosine once said, I am just like the boy from the story, Pecaf. Jill recounts her history with Rosine, noting the red-colored stone, i.e. Behalet, she carried around with her. One night, she said goodbye to Jill and disappeared into the Misty Valley, apparently sacrificing her parents to become an apostle. Rosine then comes to Jill and invites her to the Misty Valley. Guts lunges in with his sword and injures Rosine, causing her to become enraged. Rosine then flies away with Jill and entices her to become an elf. Guts enters the Misty Valley, only to find the bandits that harass Jill, but this time, they have transformed into demonic creatures. Guts staves off the insect-like apostles, but quickly realizes there are numerous more. Yet, despite the improbable odds, Guts gets a crazed look in his eye, and begins slaughtering every last one of them. As Guts continues fighting against a praying mantis and a stag beetle, the Holy Iron Chain Knights arrive in the village and find out that the Black Swordsman killed the children and has been the instigator of numerous grisly incidents. Guts' battle with the mantis and the beetle is not going well as he's sustaining severe damage. In a last ditch effort, however, he blasts the two with his cannon and strikes them down with his massive sword. Despite this victory, Guts' blood loss is reaching a critical level. Back to Rosine and Jill, they finally reach the Misty Valley, and it looks like a virtual paradise. Rosine asks Jill to stay and become an elf, but Jill is unsure. As she contemplates the idea, Puck attempts to persuade her otherwise. Suddenly, the elves begin killing each other in a joyful manner. Horrified by the sight of dead elves turning back into dead children, Jill and Puck run away to an area with giant cocoons. Rosine enters in and explains that the cocoons are used to transform children into elves. After some disagreement between the two, Rosine sedates Jill and tells her not to worry, for she'll be an elf soon enough. Jill sees the mangled bodies and snaps out of it. Guts sets the cocoons ablaze as he smashes more elves with his sword. Jill looks at Guts and begins to tremble, feeling as though he is a terrifying monster. Meanwhile, the Holy Iron Chain Knights see the massacre the Black Swordsman left behind from earlier, and Farnese claims, Black Swordsman, no, Hawk of Darkness. I swear, I will catch you personally. I swear it's on my faith. The elves attack Guts all at once, but the Black Swordsman sets everything ablaze, including himself and uses the goo from inside the cocoons to douse himself. Guts attempts to strike Rosine, but she is too quick for his sword. Rosine then transforms into a bug-like demon, with an antenna resembling a spear, and fully charges towards Guts. Although she misses, Rosine flies by Guts at supersonic speeds, causing Guts to feel intense pain, especially in his eardrums. Guts blocks his head with his arms, and when Rosine pierces him, she takes him up to the sky. Guts feigns that he's passed out, and when Rosine lets her guard down, he blasts her with his cannon. Guts falls from the sky and crashes on the hard ground. Although causing significant damage to Rosine, Guts laments how he failed to kill her up until this point. Looking at Jill, Guts gets an idea. A savage idea. Rosine rushes to Jill, and says the two can run away together. However, with the Apostle distracted, Guts gashes Rosine with his sword. And as a result, blood and a dead corpse fall onto Jill, causing her to laugh maniacally. Guts holds on to Rosine as she flies into the air. 
In the climactic battle, Rosine is absolutely losing it, laughing in a crazed manner, and Guts is going just as insane with vengeance. Guts eventually slices Rosine open like a watermelon as he falls back to the ground and Rosine does the same. We then take a brief glimpse into the past. When Rosine first went to the Misty Valley, she was looking for elves but couldn't find any, and her father and mother found her. But unfortunately, her father began to slap her and call her an idiot for believing in such things. At the peak of emotional turmoil, Rosine began to cry and the Behalit activated. And we can thusly conclude that Rosine did in fact sacrifice her parents to become an apostle. As Rosine is in her final moments, she begins to talk to Jill on how there were no elves. But Puck reassures her that at one point, there were elves in the Misty Valley. Despite this bittersweet ending, Guts begins to absolutely lose himself in rage. Guts, apoplectic with rage, brings his sword to its apex, readying it to strike Rosine. Jill, with tears in her eyes, pleads with Guts to stop. Guts, with his rage at its peak, is hit with an arrow from Jill's father and is chased away by the Holy Iron Chain Knights. Rosine wakes up and says she has to fly home for dinner. After some touching moments, Rosine fades away into the night. The Holy Iron Chain Knights continue looking for Guts, as Jill asks to travel with the Black Swordsman. Guts shows her the world she'd be entering if she did so. Guts slices some demon spirits, covers Jill with his cloak, and says, There's no paradise for you to escape to. Guts leaves into the night, and Jill says goodbye to Puck as day breaks. Skull Knight sees the remnants of Guts' mess in the Misty Valley. Skull Knight finds Rosine's Behalet and mysteriously eats it. Guts is haunted by evil spirits that tell him he'll become a beast of darkness if he continues on his current path. As Guts wonders how many more apostles he has to kill to reach Griffith, Puck rejoins Guts' journey. But it looks like the Holy Iron Chain Knights have found their target. Farnese tells her men to seize the Black Swordsman. In his exhausted state, Guts can't swing his sword, so he gets a little bit creative with dodging the soldiers. But when he's cornered, he musters all the strength he can and cuts through five men at once. Vice Commander Azan intervenes with his iron club and throws a barrage of swift yet precise attacks Guts' way. Despite his debilitated state, Guts dodges well enough. But as he starts to lose feeling in his limbs, Guts jumps on Azan's club and goes for Farnese. As Farnese trembles in fear, she feebly attacks Guts, while Serpico tosses a dart in Guts' thigh. Overcome with damage and exhaustion, Guts face plants, and the Holy Iron Chain Knights cheer Farnese's valor. Guts is placed in a medieval restraint as he's taken to the Holy Iron Chain Knights encampment. Farnese begins to question Guts' motives, but when Guts mocks her conception of God, Farnese whips him with fury. Guts is placed in a small cage in the frigid night, just as the demons are drawn to his blood. Luckily, Puck stole the keys to the cage, and when Guts goes to retrieve his gear, he sees Farnese, shirtless and participating in self-flagellation. With a small chop, Guts incapacitates Farnese and uses her as a hostage to escape the Holy Iron Chain Knights. Serpico makes chase though, but as he draws his crossbow, he notices a cavalcade of demonic spirits. The spirits attack Guts, and Farnese begins to panic. After being thrown from the horse, Farnese sees the spirits enter wild dogs and can't believe her eyes. Guts responds, That is why it's called a miracle. Guts slashes the demonic dogs as Farnese goes to the horse to mount it and escape. But this is no ordinary horse. No, it is the infamous Rape Horse of Berserk. <laughs> After seeing Farnese in distress and being reminded of Casca, Guts slashes the horse and the other demons until daybreak. Farnese bemoans her uselessness while an evil spirit enters her body. The spirit insinuates that she whips herself for sexual pleasure. Farnese then strips and climbs on top of Guts' sword. With her vag on the blade, she asks Guts to split her open, slowly. 
Puck wards off the spirit, and Farnese tells Serpico to kill Guts. <laughs> Serpico sidesteps this request, but proves his mettle with a quick draw of the sword. Plagues and calamitous events are ravishing the land, but the people believe a desired hawk will bring peace. Laban, a Midland general, sees the devastation and dreadful state of affairs. As Laban reflects on the downfall of the kingdom, the second-in-command reports that the king has succumbed to illness. The rats then configure themselves to resemble Conrad of the God Hand. Charlotte is summoned to the king in his dying state. Foss then says, the hawk will come again. The king is in a state of delirium, seeing the Griffith-like hawk come down and prevent Charlotte from touching him. Thunder cracks in the sky, and the king passes away. In a battlefield, Zod kills 300 armed soldiers. Afterwards, he wonders if anyone besides Skull Knight can challenge him. The White Hawk descends upon him. Zod roars with all his strength, but the Hawk slices off one of his horns with a gust of wind. An ominous quote is read, When the sky falls at the holy ground where blind sheep gather and erect a pillar of fire, it will come. The desired will come. Guts takes a nap and dreams of Casca getting burned at the stake. Upon waking up, Guts sees the demon child once more, but this time with Casca's face. And she repeats the same prophecy that Zod just heard. Worried about Casca, Guts returns to Godo's house. Erica took Casca to pick fruit, and Casca escaped. Erica sobs and berates Guts for leaving for two years. Guts then finds out that Godo is in poor health. Godo proceeds to lecture Guts on how he should abandon his current path, as he's become a metaphorical sword with a large crack. Rickert and Erica take Guts to the Hill of Swords, a resting ground for the fallen members of the Band of the Hawk. Guts rests up for the night, but Godo's words about abandoning Casca ring in his head. As Guts relives the Eclipse, the Beast of Darkness returns and tells Guts, the blood must flow, so keep killing. It will still thirst, forever, all alone, always. Guts wonders if he's made the same mistake in leaving the hawk that he made with Casca, but he stands and proclaims, I'll never lose her again. Although he's ill, Goto refashioned Guts' sword to its former glory, and Rickert repairs Guts' prosthetic arm. Guts makes his way to St. Albion Temple, otherwise known as the Tower of Conviction. The Holy Iron Chain Knights talk about the Kushan invasion that happened recently, and we see a glimpse of Farnese being relieved of her assignment of capturing the Black Swordsman. Their new assignment is to guard the most feared and reviled Inquisitor in the land, Mosgus. A group of people are after Mosgus's head, but his disciples, or torturers, take care of business. Mosgus then proclaims that all the accused of murder will be condemned to death by the wheel. A sobbing man falls into Casca's arms, pleading for help. Luca, a new character, takes Casca away from the abhorrent event, but Casca, in her childlike state, simply smiles in joy. A teenage kid, Isidro, poisons some men who try to steal his food. Just then, Kushan soldiers kill the men leaving Isidro in a distressed state. Guts enters the scene, does some Guts things, and leaves Isidro flabbergasted. Salat and the Bakiraka see the affair, but choose to restrain themselves for now, and focus on finding the Land of Oracle. At a refugee camp, the skin of a flayed priest hangs from a branch. The refugees beg the Holy Iron Chain Knights for rations and firewood, but Mosgus intervenes and claims, God shall show his mercy. After tending to a woman's dying child, Mosgus takes the mother to a torture chamber, where she is burned with hot coals, leaving Farnese in a state of shock. While having sex with a soldier, Luca finds out that none of the Holy Iron Chain Knights respect Farnese. With the pull of a curtain, Casca, or should I say Elaine, pokes her head into the tent. The man hands Luca her payment, and an expensive necklace that she splits with the other prostitutes. Luca hands Nina some medicine, and Nina takes Casca to the river, 
Nina lifts her dress, where she bleeds profusely. She also notes the inside of her mouth is swollen. As the sun sets, evil spirits are drawn to Casca's brand of sacrifice. The demon child sees Casca, and Casca cries out to it, but Nina pulls her away. Farnese and Serpco talk to the Crow Man and find out that all of Mosgus' disciples were saved by him to carry out God's will. When they encounter Mosgus, he is kneeling before the White Hawk statue, i.e. the Holy See, and he proceeds to smash his face and entire body into the stone ground. After performing this prostration 1,000 times, Mosgus tells Farnese the story of the Sage and King Geyseric. Farnese raises questions about spreading fear and impoverishing people's spirits. But Mosgus reiterates that thou shall not question God's will. A boy named Joachim comes to Nina, and after getting upset with him, she tells him to come to the riverside by midnight. Nina gets Joachim to admit his love, so she grabs his hand and urges him to see the edge of the world with her. Nina takes Joachim to a pagan sex orgy where fornication is as ubiquitous as the air you breathe. To become initiated, Joaquim must kiss the leader's heart and penis, which looks like a snake, and drink from a bowl. The bowl, unfortunately, has a human finger and subsequently runs away. Luca walks in and physically punishes Nina for her abhorrent behavior. While walking Nina back home, Casca walks in on the orgy, and when she's stripped by one of the members, she screams, and evil spirits begin to infiltrate people's bodies. Before anything happens though, the demon child protects Casca and disappears into nothingness. Isidro, who's been tailing Guts, attempts to pilfer his sword, but it's simply too massive. Guts tells Isidro to scram, but then the dead bodies on the wagon wheels come along, and it's time for some more slashing and gashing. After Isidro breaks his sword, Guts tosses him down a hill. Guts then runs away for an entire day, attempting to reach the Tower of Conviction, before running into an old friend. Skull Knight and Guts seem to be converging on the same location, and it's possible the leader of the God Hand will be there as well. Skull Knight also reveals that every 1,000 years, someone in the Divine Realm is incarnated in the human world, and the revelation foretells a Hawk of Light. Essentially, the event imitates the Eclipse. Skull Knight mentions that all events fall within the flow of causality. However, minute details cannot be predicted by the God Hand, and Skull Knight will attempt to exploit this to his advantage. Skull Knight leaves by saying, Your lover will be left alone. It won't be as simple as catching two birds. Farnese gives the orders to burn three heretics at the stake. Serpico excuses himself and tells Jerome that his mother was burned at the stake before his eyes. Farnese recalls the first time she watched someone burn at the stake and how she enjoyed throwing the torches into the fire. To assuage her guilt, Farnese proceeds to masturbate, but the feelings of guilt are too strong. Pepe, a prostitute under Luca, is bound up by Knights of the Holy See. Luca backtalks the soldier, and the soldier readies his whip, but Guts catches it and crushes his face with his hand, asking where the woman is with the brand on her chest. Guts obliterates the guards, shocking everyone in sight. The soldiers eventually flee in fear, and Luca takes Guts to Casca. But when they arrive at the tent, Nina and Casca are gone. A group of heretics, who think Casca's a sorcerer, abduct the two girls. Joachim elucidates the location of the heretic hideout to the Holy Iron Chain Knights. Meanwhile, Isidro, who is at the entrance of the hideout, hears the heretics say they will cut out Nina's heart as an offering to the witch. Isidro distracts the cultist, while Puck goes to Guts. Casca's brand bleeds, and the evil spirits possess the cultist, while the Holy Iron Chain Knights enter the cave. Isidro saves Casca and Nina, while the goat-headed leader is possessed. The leader looks to mate with Casca, but Guts lunges in and creates a whirlwind of death. After two years, Guts and Casca look at each other, and damn if it's not epic. 
Vernice is alarmed at the presence of the Black Swordsman, but urges her soldiers to fight. While escaping, Guts clashes with the cultist leader, and even gets knocked to the ground. But Guts is unwavering in his mission, and thusly claims, I'm taking her with me, this time for sure. After some nifty moves, Guts catches the leader and slices his head off. A pair of mysterious eyes watches Guts. Serpico corners Guts on a narrow ledge, and the two begin to fight each other. The advantage of this approach for Serpico is that because of Guts' right arm being pinned up against the wall, he isn't able to draw his massive sword. Furthermore, the sun is in Guts' eyes, and his heavy equipment is more of a hindrance than a help. Despite this, Guts catches Serpico's sword with his hand, crushes it, and points his bow at him. But Serpico's evasive moves allow him to escape the Black Swordsman, for now. Afterwards, Guts sees Casca being taken away by the Holy Iron Chain Knights. Guts heads to the Tower of Conviction, as the mysterious eyes watch from the Holy See statue. While in a jail cell, the torturers take Nina through the torture chambers, as she urinates in fear. Farnese is ordered to leave Albion by her father. Farnese then excoriates Serpico and blames him for snitching on her to the Vandemayan family, i.e. Farnese's family. In the torture chamber, Mosgus finds out that the witch, Casca, was venerated by the cultist. And when he sees the brand mark, he has her placed in an Iron Maiden. The blood on the spikes reacts to the brand, causing Casca to escape a gruesome death. Guts enters the Tower of Conviction, while the spirits in the torture chamber engulf the whole area. Guts asks Farnese where Casca is, and she reveals she's in the lower torture chamber. Luca, with the help of Jerome, saves Nina from her cell, but they quickly run into the evil spirits from the torture chamber. While Guts continues to search for Casca, the evil spirits enter Mosgus's prayer room, while the mysterious creature with eyes looks on in. The demon child protects Casca from the evil spirits as the mysterious being with eyes pokes Mosgus. I have witnessed a miracle! Holding Casca in his arms in front of Luca and friends, Mosgus claims he must burn the witch. The torturers attack while Luca and friends look to escape. Nina can't support Luca's weight and eventually drops her. But before hitting the ground, Skull Knight catches the girl and brings her to safety. Then he stares at the mysterious creature with eyes and tells him to show himself. Mosgus grows wings and tells Guts he will pay for his sins. Guts fights Mosgus' disciples, who all grow wings as well, and seems to have success, but they are stronger than first thought. Skull Knight initiates his battle with the mysterious being. It is then that Luca sees a sight beyond words. The being recounts his life story by stating he was ostracized by society and was driven underground where corpses were tossed. Eventually, he met with the five angels, and he was transformed into the egg that will hatch the quote-unquote perfect world. He then divulges that he has been nudging critical events along to a desired time that is guided by a greater will, possibly the gears of fate. Skull Knight chases away the egg, but when he escapes with Luca, they see a giant egg. Guts struggles with Mosgus's disciples, but eventually blasts and cuts his way through. However, he does sustain critical damage in the process. Skull Knight notes the time is ripe for it to take form. The monsters destroy the base of the tower as everything begins to collapse. Amidst all the wreckage, the tower resembles the God Hand from the Eclipse. Fires engulf the refugee camp to create the Brand of Sacrifice. Mosgus urges the people to erect a pillar, of which they will use to burn the witch. The four members of the God Hand, save for Griffith, manifest via evil spirits in a semi-corporeal form. Casca is placed at the stake, while Guts desperately fights his way through the monsters. After releasing Luca, Skull Knight comes face to face with the immortal Zod. While slowly dying, the egg consumes the demon child and says, let us die together. The crowd screams for Casca's demise, but just as fire singes her clothes, Isidro pulls Casca to safety. Thou shalt not! 
screams Mosgus. As Guts pierces through the wall of monsters and lunges into Mosgus. The demon that is the Black Swordsman defeats the angel. Guts wonders why the demon child was in the egg and begins to reach for Casca. But then, swift is heaven's vengeance. Mosgus breathes a hell like fire on Guts. But the Black Swordsman pushes his way through and jabs his sword in the Inquisitor's mouth. Nina, plagued with stress, falls off the tower into a merchant's shop. Guts and Mosgus continue their battle, but Guts is troubled with finding a weak spot on Mosgus' armored body. Mosgus batters Guts with God's pressure, but the Black Swordsman rams his sword through the Inquisitor's body, lifts him up into the air, and tosses his candied ass off the Tower of Conviction. The Holy Sea followers are consumed in darkness as Guts embraces Casca. As the people stampede away from the monsters, Luca saves Nina from being trampled. Guts and the gang make a fire to ward off the oncoming monsters. The situation looks insurmountable as the living dead form the semi-corporeal god hand, and everyone is crying out for the desired to come. The demon child begins to transform into the Hawk of Light, the exalted phoenix who will bring peace upon the world. Day breaks, and Guts and the crew are all safe. Salat and the Bakiraka arrive to witness the Oracle, but attack Guts' crew instead. After fending them off, Zod bursts through the remnants of the tower and begins running in a mysterious fashion. Guts looks over his shoulder and notices the Skull Knight as he is pointing in the direction of the newly reincarnated Griffith. Everyone instinctively knows the desired has come. Zod bows down to his new master, while Guts begins to lose himself in rage. That is, until he remembers his vow to protect Casca. Salat orders the Bakiraka warrior clan to seize Griffith, but Zod tears them to shreds. Casca, drawn to the demon child body that Griffith inhabits, reaches out for the White Hawk. The Kushan army head toward Albion, while Zod flies Griffith away from the wreckage. Guts and Casca slice through the Kushan soldiers as they chase Griffith and the demonic creature. Farnese begins to question her own faith as she resigns from the Holy Iron Chain Knights and endeavors to follow Guts in his journey against the darkness. Nina leaves Luca and starts a life with Joaquim, and Skull Knight notes that with the fissure, the shape of the world began to crumble. Zod flies over a dreamlike forest while Guts and Casca return to Erica after she just said good morning to her father. Goto passed away shortly after Guts left last time, and Erica suggests that they should all live together for now on. Erica then mentions that Rickard has been talking to a silver haired man on the Hill of Swords. Guts' rage unleashes at the sight of Griffith, but Rickard, unknowing to what Griffith did during the eclipse, stops Guts. Griffith notes his new body of flesh makes him free. Guts yells at Griffith for his lack of remorse, but Griffith says, I'll not betray my dream. Guts swings his sword in rage, but Zod intervenes. The two go back and forth for a while, but it's clear Guts is on the defensive. However, Guts eventually lands a blow on the immortal creature, while Griffith contemplates his inner feelings that seem to originate within the demon child which fused with his vessel. Zod transforms, giving Guts everything he can handle, and then some. Casca, sensing the presence of the demon child, approaches the hill. As Zod shatters a nearby rock, Griffith shields the former unit commander of the Hawk. Casca cries out as she senses the child within Griffith, but Griffith and Zod retreat, as Griffith reminds Guts what he truly desires. Griffith extends an invitation to Rickert to join his cause if he so desires. Meanwhile, Guts readies his bow, but again, Rickert stops him. After Griffith leaves, Guts tells Rickard everything about the Eclipse, and Rickard insists on joining Guts on his vengeance trail, but Guts refuses. With the destruction of the Fairy Cove that Guts lived in briefly, Puck recommends that they go to his home, Elfhelm. For now, Guts and Casca leave Rickert and Erica. The Kushan army invade a Midland town, while a young girl, Sonia, says, 
the Hawk of Light is coming. Kushan General excoriates the Lat and the Bakuraka for not catching the Hawk. An arrow aimed at the general is caught by Salat, as his two Tapasa guards eliminate the instigators. Salat returns to his mission of finding the hawk, while Griffith casually rides into the village. Griffith swiftly kills the general, while Zod plows through a crowd of soldiers. The Moonlight Knight, Locus, offers his sword to Griffith, and helps Zod in demolishing the Kushans. Sonya approaches Griffith as the Tapasa lunge in, but they are pushed back by a cryptic being cloaked in black, wearing a three-eyed mask. The man is Roxas, a Kushan exile, who vows to lop off Griffith's head. However, for the time being, he'll protect him until that day comes. A man in a dragon armor, Grunbeld, smashes his way through and eventually pledges his allegiance to the ever-growing Hawk. Meanwhile, a witch, who transfers her spirit to a bird, watches the affair and mentions how the Hawk of Darkness will usher in a new age of darkness. Farnese and Serpico follow the Black Swordsman, while Guts fends off some snow demons. Guts is having difficulties watching after Casca and not being reminded of her past self. The Beast of Darkness returns to Guts at the nighttime goading him into killing Casca and pursuing Griffith instead. Guts wakes up and stabs the Incubus on his shoulder. While fighting monsters, Guts is possessed and begins to strangle Casca. Afterwards, Casca grows wary of the Black Swordsman, forcing Guts to restrain her mobility with a leash. The emotional distance grows ever wider between the former lovers. As Guts naps, Casca escapes her bondage, but falls in the hands of three lustful soldiers, who strip her clothes off. Casca's muscle memory from her days with the hawk kicks in, as she dispatches the three hastily. Upon seeing Casca's naked body, Guts's libido kicks in, and after dodging Casca's sword strike, he pins her down and forces his lips upon her. Casca resists, but the Beast of Darkness eggs him on to tear her to shreds. Guts pulls back before losing all control. Afterwards, Guts is visited by some familiar faces. Farnese then kneels in the presence of the Black Swordsman, requesting to accompany him on his travels. Isidro excoriates Farnese for nearly having Casca burned and demands she grovel to prove her loyalty. Farnese cuts her hair, shocking Isidro. Guts then permits the unification but warns there will be no more restful nights from here on. Lord Mule, a Midland nobleman, looks to enact vengeance on the Kushans who displaced the Midland royal families. One of the soldiers says the White Hawk is liberating Midland territories from the Kushan army. Lord Mule sees the Kushans rounding up Midland civilians and charges in with his regiment. Mule quickly discovers the Kushans are using Midland prisoners and not their own forces. The odds are not in Mule's favor, but reinforcements come in via Griffith's horde of demon soldiers, led by Zod. Sonya, who is a mind reader, communicates instructions to Griffith as he flies in through the enemy front and lops off the head of the Kushan leader. Following the battle, Sonya welcomes Mule to the Band of the Hawk. Mule is shocked to see Kushan warriors in the Hawk's camp. But Locus explains that the enemy warriors that survive three battles are given the choice of conciliation or death. Sonia and Mule make their way through Griffith's various war demons. Mule recognizes the towering Grunbeld, otherwise known as the Great Flame Dragon. Despite this, Mule thinks that Grunbeld died long ago in battle. Zod is the last demon they encounter before seeing Griffith, surrounded by dead souls. Griffith allows family members to say goodbye to their deceased loved ones before they go to a place where they all become one. Humbled by Griffith's mere presence, Mule offers his sword to Griffith and feels that his involvement with the Hawk will be the stuff of legends. Meanwhile, Farnese is beginning to feel useless as she is more of a hindrance than anything else. One day, she loses sight of Casca and ends up hiding in a tree all night. A shepherd gives Guts and the gang directions to Virtanis, a port by the sea that will allow them to reach Puck's homeland, Elfhelm. But with all the military activity, it's going to be dangerous, and they also need to avoid trolls on the way there. 
Guts continues training Isidro, and it looks like the young lad is making some progress. But Guts urges the lad to utilize his wits to think through battles, rather than coming in with a preset plan. Serpco tells Guts that if Farnese wishes to continue her adventure with the Black Swordsman, then he'll do his best to get along. However, if things go awry, Serpico will hash things out with his sword. A troll snatches Farnese and Casca, but Isidro stops it by chucking a rock at its head. The troll clenches its axe with fury as Isidro draws his sword, readying himself for a legitimate battle. The troll pushes Isidro around and eventually looks poised for the final blow. But a witch throws berries at its face and tells Isidro to take a look around. Surrounded by beastly trolls, the witch uses various magical spells to drive them away. Guts wonders if there could be an apostle in the area, before they run into a man that was attacked by trolls. The man identifies as Morgan, and is looking for a witch to save his village from the trolls. After crossing the witch's magical barrier, they arrive at a cryptic house with trees growing out of it. Just then, hordes of golems begin to converge on Guts and the gang, and the Black Swordsman does what he does best, slicing and dicing. The golems continue coming, until Serpco finds out that a miniature version of the golem must be destroyed to prevent it from regenerating. Shirka, the small witch, is told by her mistress to invite the new visitors into the house. The mistress, Flora, welcomes them into the mansion of the spirit tree, and acknowledges that Guts and Casca are both branded, and she's been waiting for their arrival. Flora and Guts strike a verbal deal that if Guts helps Shirka in protecting Morgan's village, she'll produce a talisman that will weaken the effects of the Brand of Sacrifice. During dinner, Flora elaborates on the astral world being like the afterlife. Shirka expands on this by saying that the astral world is the world of spirits, and that the other is the origin of all existence, the world of idea. And as one descends deeper in the astral world, there may even exist a place of heaven and hell. Guts shows Flora a behalot, and the witch claims that it links the lower levels of the astral world to the physical. She then says Guts' malice, which has kept him alive to this point, is also a shackle that threatens those closest to him. Flora then says that the members of the God Hand were once human, and now execute the will of something lurking in the abyss of the astral realm. Shirka tells Flora that Guts is foolish for opposing the transcendental entities, especially if that being is the Hawk the Absolute. Flora advises Shirka to be more open-minded about fate, for it may be her destiny to aid the struggler on his journey. Shirka draws the talisman on Guts' brand and gives everyone a magical fetish to fend off the ethereal beings, like the trolls. Serpico receives a wind cloak and sword. Isidro receives a salamander dagger, which has fire elementals, and Casca and Farnese receive silver chain shirts, while Farnese also gets a silver knife. Flora sees them off. Shortly after, she has a cryptic conversation with the Skull Knight, who seems to know her quite well. Trolls attack the village of Enoch, as Morgan returns during a funeral. Morgan shows Shirka to the villagers, but they are skeptical that a mere child can help them. The village priest reinforces their doubts, and even claims that witches are symbols of wickedness. Despite this, Guts secures lodging for his companions. Shirka offers everyone a piece of her hair to tie around their finger, so that they can communicate with one another through thought transference. Shirka assumes the leadership position in the future battle, but it angers Isidro. Fuming, Isidro goes to the river to swing his sword. He then encounters Morgan, and the old man tells the boy how witches saved his mother from the brink of death. Guts saves Shirka from some boys throwing rocks at her. Shirka then tells Guts that the Holy See built this church in Enoch on holy land, and have thus tarnished the area for political power. In addition, because of the Holy See's influence, the villagers of Enoch drove Flora away from this area long ago. Hence, Shirka despises them. Just then, a small army of trolls rushes into the village, as the villagers seek safety in the church. Serpico uses his magical fetish to slice the heads off two trolls. The sheer number of repulsive creatures forces them to run, until Casca trips and Farnese shields her with her body. Serpico defends the two and is shocked to see Farnese put someone else's life before her own. Guts walks in and slices multiple trolls at once. The townsfolk are impressed with Guts' performance, as Shirka remarks, he is superhuman. Shirka announces that she will use magic to extend the bulwark, i.e. the defensive barrier, around the church. 
and uses thought transference to ask the three guys to buy some time. The priest, outraged with Shirka's wicked behavior, commands her to cease her activity. It is then that Farnese draws a parallel between the priest's behavior and her own as leader of the Holy Iron Chain Knights. Farnese stops the priest as Shirka performs her incantation. The villagers enter the church, only to see the trolls already inside. Guts continues fending off the trolls as Serpico and Istro go in the church. Trolls surround Casca on the church as Farnese does her best to ward them off. Isidro ends up in a compromised position, but is saved by Morgan. Shirka summons the Lords of the East, West, South, and North to protect the church. The magic that pervades the land incinerates the trolls, heals up Morgan's wounds, and repels all spiritual beings that would bring harm. Shirka enlightens the priest by stating that she has built a shrine in her heart to communicate with the spiritual beings. A large ogre makes its presence known, and although it cannot cross Shirka's barrier, it can throw physical objects in and cause severe damage. Shirka asks for more time to use her magic, so Guts takes on the responsibility of fighting off the ogre by himself. Water begins to descend on the town as a Kelpie walks in on the affair. Given their current predicament, Serpco decides to help Guts with the Kelpie to buy Shirka more time. Guts and Serpco fight their respective monsters as Shirka enters deeper in the astral realm and eventually sees a magical sanctuary that existed before the church. Serpco has trouble with the Kelpie as it begins to drown him. After escaping, Serpico gains the upper hand and cuts the Kelpie's left eye out. Shirka becomes one with the water spirit in Enoch and summons a deluge to wash away the spirits. Despite her success, Shirka's alignment with the water spirit becomes too strong, and if she does not return to her physical body, the floods will continue. Furthermore, if someone attempts to jar her awake, her spiritual body may never return, leaving her a vegetable. Farnese attempts to bring her back, nonetheless, but bumps Casca off the roof of the church. Isidro snaps Shirka out of her trance, but the crew can't seem to find Casca or Farnese. Shirka uses her ability to determine the location of the two missing girls. The townsfolk, along with the priest, offer their thanks for Shirka's services. Morgan, who can see that Isidro is down on himself, offers him a sword that will be easy for him to handle in battle. Serpico, who is injured in battle, tells Guts that he is leaving Lady Farnese in his hands. Guts, Shirka, and Isidro enter the troll cave to find the girls, but see a weird creature lingering about. Shirka says this is a sign that they are in Quithoth, the dark domain of the spirit realm. Shirka notes the irregularity of the spiritual and physical worlds overlapping like this, and says, The world will undergo a transfiguration. No, perhaps that has already begun, along with the appearance of a certain man. Shirka wakes up Farnese and Casca through thought transference, and the two girls soon realize the gravity of their situation. Farnese keeps Casca close as they notice a group of trolls raping and mutilating human women. The trolls surround the two girls as Farnese ineffectively attempts to scare them off. Gut shoots his revolving bow and kills the group of trolls. Shirka announces they've come to save the girls. Guts tells Isidro to protect the women as he prepares for another battle with the hairy monsters. Guts easily dispatches the droves of trolls as Shirka and the gang get cornered. In an instant, the trolls are slaughtered and a gust of wind streams past them. In the wreckage, a weird feeling consumes Guts. Casca and Guts' brands bleed profusely as the trolls' intestines begin to manifest in the form of Slan from the God Hand. Guts attacks, but the female God Hand member pulls him in. Due to the ominous energy flow, Shirka decides to set up a magical barrier outside the cave to prevent the trolls and other evil entities from escaping. Due to Slan's mere presence, Guts' brand is eliciting immense pain. Things are dire until Skull Knight steps in and prepares for his grisly battle. Shirka's ethereal body enters the darkness as Skull Knight slashes his way to Guts, but Guts blows a hole into Slan that she seems to enjoy very much. Skull Knight urges Guts to impale her, but when he does, she becomes lustful and even kisses the Black Swordsman. Slan's troll intestine body disintegrates as Shirka possesses a god of the rotting roots that transforms the trolls into food for maggots. The crumbling cave blocks Guts' escape. That's when the Skull Knight pulls a sword from inside his body that was forged via eating behalots. 
He names the weapon the Sword of Actuation. Skull Knight cleaves through space to escape the demonic realm. Before leaving, though, Shirka recognizes the knight. After their triumphant return to Enoch, Guts looks back at the gang, thinking to himself that he's found a new group of companions. Back at the mansion of the Spirit Tree, Flora places a talisman on a magical suit of armor. Skull Knight warns Flora about the dangers of the armor, while monsters break through the magical barrier. After Guts passes out from battle exhaustion, Shirka mentions how the wounds to his ethereal body have not healed. Shirka senses the forest barrier vanishing, as Guts' brand begins to bleed. They reach the mansion, and the house has become a blazing inferno. Guts clashes with the monsters. Skull Knight makes his presence known, and tells Guts he has a close tie to the owner of the mansion. Zod walks in on the affair, and confirms his master to be the fifth angel. Grunbeld, a giant man, challenges the black swordsman to singles combat. Shirka weeps for her missing master, but Flora uses her thought transference to communicate her final message, to get the black magical armor to Guts. Grunbeld pounds and clobbers Guts, breaking ribs in the process. Zod transforms and confronts a Skull Knight for another battle. After defeating some apostles, Shirka leads the crew to the basement, where the dangerous black suit of armor resides. Grunbeld crushes Guts with his massive foot. This lacks. After Guts insults the monster, Grunbeld pulls out his cannon and fires away. Shirka uses the golems to create a protective barrier around Guts. Through mind transference, Guts sees the black armor and runs into the mansion. The wounds take their toll on Guts as he collapses onto the ground. The crew helps Guts put on the magical armor, giving the black swordsman a boost of energy he's never quite experienced. Zod stares in awe and speaks in an ominous tone. So, you would have him follow you, down the same path, into hell. Guts begins to acknowledge the monstrous spirit that is seething within him. Guts' speed, power, and reflexes are on a whole nother level. Guts destroys Grunbeld's shield, making the dragon warrior wonder if this is the same man from earlier. Shirka mentions that the black, berserker armor allows Guts to fight without pain thereby permitting him to exceed the limits of the human body. Grunbeld swings down at the Black Swordsman, but Guts slices the Warhammer and gashes into his shoulder. Grunbeld's had enough and transforms into his Apostle form. Because of the Berserker armor, Guts' limbs are contorted and recontorted through the armor's magical effects. Shirka mentions that the previous owner was devoured by its steel teeth. Unsure what to do, Flora advises Shirka to guide Guts through the turbulence of power to prevent him from being consumed by it. Isidro notes that Guts' fighting style is more animalistic than human. Shirka then enters the ethereal realm and navigates her way through the firestorm that is Guts' anger. As she descends deeper into Guts' psyche, various memories float by until she reaches an abyss of terrifying darkness. Shirka eventually encounters her mistress's talisman and a brief light mirroring Guts' physical form, i.e. Guts' ego. Shirka uses her magic to show Guts, Casca. Just then, Guts' ethereal body takes a familiar form, and his physical body snaps out of the trance. Guts lunges through a slew of monsters to come to Casca and Farnese's aid, but the fellow branded one is still apprehensive. Flora's ethereal body takes on a heavenly glow as she instructs her most precious protege, Shirka, to leave the nest and follow her own path. Guts grabs Shirka and begins to run, as the broken-hearted student says goodbye to her caring master. Laban and the Arklo Knights arrive in Windham, a city reduced to a dreadful demon city, overflowing with corpses. Women are being marched into the castle to be used for an unknown Kushan ritual. Despite this, Princess Charlotte, who's in the highest level of the Tower of Rebirth, is still alive. The hooded man telling Laban all of this reveals himself to be Foss, and he asks, where is the hawk? Just then, Kushan-controlled monsters attack the Arklo Knights. The former Midland higher-ups get trapped by monsters, but a man with a bow, Irvine, takes them down. Locus approaches and tells the men that the hawk will return to alleviate the ills of the city via a tempest. Ganishka, the Kushan Emperor, cascades the lab for failing to capture the Hawk of Oracle, and curtails his assignment to reconnaissance. 
Angered by his reduced role, Salat tells the Tapasa that Ganishka is a dread emperor. Ganishka visits Charlotte and asks if she's prepared to bear a child. Ganishka peeks through Charlotte's bed curtains, and the young princess has a traumatic flashback of when her father tried to grope her. Ganishka notices the hawk embroidery around the room and starts to contemplate evil thoughts. Ganishka then claims, I'll reign over this unclean world as a demon king and rebel against God. Roxas easily sneaks up on Salat and the Baki Raka as the band of the hawk blitzes into Windham. Locus and Irvine annihilate the Kushan human soldiers, forcing Ganishka to call upon the Daka demon-like soldiers to defend the castle. Locus queries the demon king, why do you oppose the master? Enraged by their insolence, Ganishka proclaims, no, with my own demon-drenched hands, I will take and desecrate God. Locus decapitates numerous Daka with one swift move, impressing Ganishka. Irvine aims his bow toward the emperor, but the arrow goes straight through his body impertinence. In his apostle form, Ganishka displays his shocking power to the band of the hawk and commands them to surrender to his will. A gust of wind pervades Charlotte's room as Griffith appears before the surprised princess. Griffith kisses Charlotte's bleeding fingers as the princess falls into the hawk's warm embrace. Charlotte tells Anna, her servant, to hang on to her bed as the ceiling begins to crumble. Locus instructs his forces to withdraw as Ganishka wonders why they are retreating all of the sudden. Ganishka inspects the Tower of Rebirth and notices that the princess is missing as she flies away into the night with Griffith and Zod's assistance. Guts and the gang reach the sea. Shirka recalls their last battle and remarks, no matter how robust Guts is, if a mere human is to exchange blows with those monsters, for that, he must, as a human, become a monster. As they rest up for the night and eat their dinner, Farnese requests that Shirka teach her how to use magic. Shirka warns the eager girl that she may be past the age of learning such things, but agrees to teach her nonetheless. Shirka and Guts walk along the beachfront, discussing their new journey and how the young witch is still mourning the loss of her master. Skull Knight walks in and warns Guts about the dangers of the Berserker armor. But Shirka proclaims that she won't allow that to happen. Shirka then deduces that the Skull Knight once wore the Berserker armor himself, which Skull Knight confirms. Skull Knight foretells future battles with the Hawk's Apostles and claims that at the Land of Elves, Elfhelm, King Hanafabuki may be able to recover Casca's mind. Guts is pleased with this news, but Skull Knight warns Guts, there's no guarantee your wish will be her wish. Casca finds a mysterious dark-haired boy in the moonlight, and her maternal instincts kick in. As they decide to head in, a cryptic shadow lurks in the darkness. The moonlight child plays with Guts's armor and begins to fall towards sharp knives. Guts and Casca catch the child, looking like a family in the process. As the gang goes to sleep, an unwelcome visitor opens the door. Guts takes down the fearsome creature, but a whole swarm bears down on them. Serpico and Isidro get in on the action, while Guts slices multiple monsters at once. Shirka produces a magical field to protect the cabin. She then instructs the crew to find the spellcaster, who is manipulating the monsters. Serpico destroys the Kushans controlling the monsters, but they were also being controlled. Afterward, the monster manipulator takes hold of a massive demonic beast. Serpco jumps in, but is forced back quite easily by a stream of water. Shirka determines the spellcaster controlling this beast is at sea. After the monster battles Guts, the berserker armor envelops his body, leading him to gash the monster. Guts continues cutting the monster to pieces as the armor consumes his flesh and blood. Guts falls deeper into the darkness, losing himself and becoming more beast than man. Losing sight of all rationality, just like Skull Knight said, Guts lunges towards his friends as a luminous spirit blocks his path. The spirit touches Guts, allowing him to see Shirka's ethereal body and reach out for it. After narrowly being consumed by the darkness, Guts and the gang notice the Moonlight Boy is missing. On a Kushan ship, 
Master Daiba's army of Pishaka succeeded in their mission of subjugation. But the mysterious man wonders how one group of individuals survived the attack. Guts and the gang arrive in Vritanis, a garrison fortress of the Holy See. After Isidro knocks Shirka's hat down, resulting in it being crushed by a cart, the witch ventures off on her own, until she sees a dark, cryptic being floating in the air. Shirka walks in on an area with numerous hanged individuals. After finding out they were Kushan slaves, she orders the men to cremate the bodies. While looking for Shirka, Mule inquires Isidro about the whereabouts of the witch. While moping on a shipping dock, Shirka is approached by Sonia, who recognizes her immediately as a witch. Sonia uses an analogy about birds to describe her situation with the Band of the Hawk. As the two get up to leave, they notice some pirates chasing Kushan children, who they plan to use as slaves. Shirka uses her magic to freeze the men, but Isidro, not wanting the men to figure out that she's a witch, distracts them with his usual tactics. Mule eventually enters the arena and cuts the pirates down. Enraged by this, the pirate boss descends upon them and defeats Mule in singles combat. Isidro lunges in to save Mule, but he doesn't last long. Fortunately though, a knight was woken up and ferociously attacks the pirates while Mule saves the slave children. Sonia invites Shirka to join her on her travels. But with one look at Guts, the witch declines the offer. Before leaving, Sonia warns Shirka to flee the city. Just then, Shirka sees a vision of events that will befall Virtanis. Shirka then changes her normal attire to avoid suspicion that she's a witch. Back at the Hawks encampment, Princess Charlotte bakes Griffith some sweets. But Sonia, who has a crush on Griffith, intervenes. Mule pulls Sonia away to allow Griffith and Charlotte some private time. Unhappy with the situation, however, Sonia walks away and has a brief conversation with Irvine before falling asleep. Farnese begins her magic training by tangibly visualizing an apple in her mind, which is the first step in attaining her luminous body. Unable to secure a ship for traveling to Elfhelm, Farnese suggests an idea. She later arrives at the Vandemeyen household, only to be castigated by her father for dereliction in her duty as the leader of the Holy Iron Chain Knights. He asserts that her actions will be judged by the Holy City's Court Supreme, and that she is to abide quietly in the mansion. Farnese feebly attempts to ask for a ship for her friends, but can't get the words out. After a bath, Farnese is approached by Minifico, her older brother, who empathizes with her, as he was also slighted by the Vandemeyen head. Farnese tells Minifico her plan of asking father for a ship. But her older brother reassures her that he could procure one for her. That is, given a request. Serpico returns and gives the good news that a ship has been arranged. But Farnese will not be rejoining them. Serpico returns all the magical fetishes and abruptly leaves with no further explanation. Puck and Ivalera sneak into the Vandemeyen mansion, under the instruction of Guts, to spy on Farnese. Magnifico introduces Farnese to Roderick, an officer of the Navy, who is to be her fiancé. The two elves report the news to Guts, and after Casca drops the deed to the ship in the fire, Guts decides it's time to retrieve Farnese. Farnese continues her visualization training on her own. She then tells Serpico how she's a fool and a coward for running back home. Lady Vandemeyen, Farnese's mother, tells her daughter that the head of the Vandemeyen fears her rambunctious, hellstorm of a daughter, chiefly because he cannot control her. Guts and the crew approach the Vandemeyen estate as an aristocratic carriage goes by with Lady Farnese inside. A ball is held shortly after, with many foreign dignitaries there, attempting to curry favor with the Vandemeyen Bank, who is the main financial backer of numerous nations. Magnifico and Roderick both bemoan their respective fathers' close-mindedness and lack of forethought in thinking beyond their limited domains. Roderick then takes Farnese to dance, as Magnifico is shocked to see his own mother at the party. Lady Vandemeyen warns Magnifico about his sister, and moves her way to Serpico. She recognizes him from 10 years ago, and remarks that he must be warped to have stayed with her daughter for so long. Guts and the gang slip past the guards to enter the ball, but fog and monsters begin to pervade the area. Shirka talks to Serpico through mind transference, and when they meet up with him, Serpico tells the gang that they cannot see Lady Farnese, and he thusly challenges Guts to a duel. 
the layout of the room has numerous pillars, which slows down Guts' sword enough to allow Serpico to dodge. Serpico continues to narrowly dodge Guts' strikes, as he reminisces about his time with the Black Swordsman, and how it changed him. Serpico reaches the last pillar, and Guts smashes it, but the stones begin to descend upon the Black Swordsman's head. This is Serpico's chance. But the Black Swordsman blocks the stones with his sword, and clubs Serpico over the head. After the duel, Shirka announces that the monsters at the ball are similar to the familiars on the beach. The crew prepares for battle, as Shirka returns Serpico's magical fetishes. Lord Van de Mayen proposes a toast to the various dignitaries, who will soon engage in a holy war. Magnifico interjects, announcing the marriage of Roderick and Farnese. Uh, there's just one problem. Farnese is missing. A window is smashed open, and a massive tiger monster slashes some noblemen. The party guests run in fear, but the exits are all blocked. Farnese uses fire to ward off the beast. Looks like the party's in full swing. Guts wastes no time in slicing the tiger down the middle, shocking everyone. Serpco brings Farnese to her old companions, pleasing Casca immensely. Guts says they should leave, but Farnese begs for him to protect her family, to which Guts grudgingly obliges. Shirka unleashes some thorn snakes and gives Farnese a ring in which she can control them to her will. Roderick attempts to help, but is ineffective. Farnese urges him to use a silver weapon against the monsters. Serpco dispatches the spellcasters controlling the tigers, and Shirka bounces the monsters with her magic. Guts then queries Farnese if this is her last stop on her journey, but it looks like her journey is just beginning. Lord Vandemayan displays his gratitude to his saviors, but just then, the apostle form of Ganishka rears its ugly head and gives a fierce warning. The illusions that you saw, know this, that they are the start of a nightmare without end this evening. Monsters begin burning and destroying the city from every direction. Roderick offers his boat and services to Guts for the journey to Elfhelm, in an attempt to prove himself worthy of Farnese's hand. Farnese tacitly says goodbye to her parents as they leave the party. Guts runs into Owen, the former leader of the Midland Tomel Knights, who immediately recognizes the raider's captain of the Band of the Hawk. Owen inquires about Griffith, but Guts walks away, acting as if he knows nothing. We then move over to the current pontiff, who is in a dreadful physical and psychological state, merely waiting for death to come. A divine dream with a hawk enraptures the pontiff. Upon waking, Sonia and Mule greet his holiness, and request he comes to meet their lord. The pontiff agrees without hesitation. Upon hearing the dreadful news from Virtanus, the pontiff feels that this is a sign of a revelation. Guts and the gang do their best to defend Virtanus from the monsters. Fires rage through the city as Guts and the crew are surrounded by horrible creatures. Serpico and Isidro take care of the smaller monsters, while Guts fights with the behemoth. After taking care of business, Guts urges his companions to leave at once. Shirka senses a slew of monsters infesting the harbor. Guts prepares to use his berserker armor and tap into the Beast of Darkness energy, disturbing Shirka greatly. Although she's having difficulty sensing ethereal beings, Shirka picks up on a lead in the flames engulfing the city. In the ethereal realm, Shirka navigates through a hellfire that is similar to Purgatory. Guts slices through the horde of Daka as the Beast of Darkness ascends ever higher. Just then, Shirka embodies the Wheel of Flame spirit, and thusly incinerates the Daka to mere embers. Exhausted from her magical spell, Shirka is carried by Guts as they look for a boat to escape on. Just then, multiple Makara emerge from the water to block their path. With no other options, Guts allows the Beast of Darkness to take over, as Shirka mistakenly hangs on with her ethereal body. Guts slaughters the Makara as Shirka stares on from the inside of Guts' armor with awe. The battle takes a massive toll on Guts' body, especially when the Makara pierces his armor. However, he defeats them nonetheless. As Guts recovers, a colossal Galias comes forth. Daiba floats above the deck as he inspects the swordsman who killed his Makara. Shirka notices that Daiba can utilize magic, as Daiba makes the same assessment about his new foes. Daiba implores Guts to come at him. 
gut splits is in, but Daiba creates a water spout that ensnares the Black Swordsman. Shirka aids Guts in seeing past the Beast of Darkness field of vision, which allows him to regain his composure and control his landing. Guts dodges the numerous water spouts and deflects another one that was heading towards his companions. To the surprise of his friends, it would seem Guts has tempered the Beast of Darkness within, thanks to Shirka's help. Guts asks for Serpico's assistance as the Black Swordsman cuts Daiba's water spout. Daiba powers up, but Isidro throws an explosive at his side. Daiba then summons the Kundalini Water Serpent, his most powerful creature. Shirka warns Guts that the Kundalini may be on the level of a polytheistic god. Shirka identifies the true body of the Kundalini, and Guts makes it his mission to cut it. But to do so, he'll need Shirka to call upon the Wheel of Flame Spirit for assistance. Guts lunges into the Kundalini's head and utilizes the burst of flame to blow the serpent apart. Daiba looks to escape on his Garuda, but then the Emperor interjects. You've blundered, Daiba! Not only did you lose most of the Makara, but the Kundalini was slaughtered! Ganishka shocks Daiba and tells him to fall back. Ganishka then says, Are you the follower of my arch enemy, the Hawk? Ganishka eventually shocks Guts with lightning, as Shirka is displaced from the armor. Despite the intense damage, Guts presses on, surprising Ganishka. Ganishka finds out Guts is branded, and queries, Wilt thou become a follower of mine? Guts respects Ganishka's disobedience to the God Hand, yet he turns down the Emperor nonetheless. Ganishka plans to smite Guts, but then notices Zod in the distance, making his grand entrance. The insects that have swarmed to the Hawk of Light have come. Ganishka scorches numerous flying monsters. Zod captures Ganishka's attention by roaring. He then attacks with all his might, but can't get close due to the lightning. The damage takes its toll on Zod as he crashes into Guts. Guts clenches onto Zod's back as the Apostle emerges from the water. Zod and Guts come to an understanding, a temporary alliance if you will even though Zod is skeptical that one can take down the Emperor. Zod and Guts harness their collective strength to pierce through the brow of Ganishka, leaving his physical body scarred and scolding. Zod and Guts' bodies are steaming from the electrical currents they flew through. Zod demands Guts to stand up afterwards so they can settle their score. Nevertheless, Zod decides to wait for a better moment, and even crushes the neck of one of his allies who wishes to dispatch the Black Swordsman, here and now. Guts presses on about Griffith's location, but Serpico dissuades the idea. Guts eventually passes out, but as he and his friends escape on a rowboat, he sees Griffith in the distance. The Kushan send an overwhelming military force to Virtanis with the Emperor ordering a purge of the Holy Sea Alliance armies. Things look dismal, until Irvine begins taking the heads off of multiple soldiers with his bow. Ganishka begins to worry about the presence of the Hawk. In the distance, Griffith looks poised to ingratiate himself into the battle. Griffith's lancers pierce through the enemy barrier, as Zod gashes his way in. The Hawk easily cuts through 200,000 Kushan soldiers with Griffith leading the charge. The hawk swiftly surrounds the Emperor's mobile palace, with Griffith gracefully entering and confronting the tyrant. This is the hawk. I'm trembling. I, the ruler of the greatest empire of this world! Ganishka gets mad at the hawk's mere presence. Griffith attempts to touch the Emperor, but Ganishka reverts to his apostle form. I am the Kushan Emperor, supreme ruler and devastator of the world. Griffith's men topple the palace as a gust of wind pierces Ganishka's face. Under the immense force of the wind, Ganishka deteriorates to his human form. An inescapable dread consumes the Emperor. Griffith proposes that the two meet in the royal capital for their showdown. Ganishka, henceforth, retreats his forces, as the Hawk claims a moral victory. Griffith, the savior, enters Virtanis, tells Lord Vandemayan, We are the Band of the Hawk, the Midland Liberation Army, under direct control of the Royal House. As the sole army of Midland, everyone who sets foot in their kingdom shall obey Griffith's orders. 
The aristocrats take umbrage with Griffith's words until Princess Charlotte reveals herself, claiming, Sir Griffith, my betrothed and leader of the Band of the Hawk, has been designated Supreme Commander of the Midland Regular Army. Lord Van de Mayen recognizes Griffith as a hero and thus has the right to command other forces in his kingdom. However, the battle with the Kushans is steeped in religious values, making it a war with the Holy See itself, and not just Midland. The pontiff's luxurious carriage breaks the conversation, as the frail old man surprises everyone via prostrating in front of Griffith, similar to how Mosga is prostrated in reverence of the Holy See statue. The pontiff then announces, The hawk of light you see here is our savior! The crowd of men then exalt their new leader, Griffith. Roderick's ship, the seahorse, has long set sail with Guts and the crew all aboard. In the lower decks, Farnese's luminous body enters the astral world for the first time. Shirka grabs Farnese's hand and shows her a sight beyond words above the ship. Guts placidly stares at Casca until his vision begins to fade to black, just as Skull Knight foretold. Roderick steps in and inquires about Casca's significance to the Black Swordsman. Just as he's answering, Farnese returns to her physical body, not wanting to know Guts' response. Casca climbs onto the boat's bowsprit, and although Guts attempts to grab her, she falls into the water. Guts lunges in to save Casca, but his prosthetic arm weighs him down into the depths of the water. As he begins to sink, he reminisces about Casca's bad happenings near water. Roderick saves the Black Swordsman, as Shirka redraws Guts' talisman. Guts then subtly analogizes replacing his arm with a prosthetic and reviving Casca's mind, in the sense that you can replace what was lost, but you can't get back what you once had. After drawing the talisman, Shirka runs through Guts' words to Roderick about Casca. But even if he loves her and not Shirka, Shirka already has a special bond that no one else shares. Armed merchants head towards Roderick's ship as he instructs everyone to their battle stations. The pirates that harassed Isidru and Virtanis raise their skull and bones flag, but Roderick blows them to shreds with his many cannons. Roderick continues to outmaneuver the foolhardy pirate captain, Bonebeard, and it forces him to eventually withdraw. Guts then struggles with a fever as the Beast of Darkness resists the chains that Shirka placed on him through the talisman. Don't think you can bind me with your yoke. May we run rampant with hatred and wild joy just to crush with these fangs the true light that burns us. Guts awakens and the crew heads upstairs to celebrate their victory over the pirates. Manifico tells Roderick that Skellig Island, i.e. the legendary island of elves, will be conquered for financial gain. Roderick tacitly declines this offer and makes his way to Farnese on the crow's nest. Although Farnese still feels useless, Roderick reassures her that she is valuable for watching over Casca, Gut's most prized possession. Foss is pleased to hear that Griffith has come back to his former glory. Laban tells everyone that Princess Charlotte is alive and with the Band of the Hawk. Children tell Laban that they've all had the same dream about the shining bird and must all leave the city at once for the true dawn is coming. Despite his poor health, the pontiff claims his destiny is to place the king's crown on Griffith's head. The gap between Griffith and Ganishka's powers is insurmountable for the emperor. I have no choice but to transcend apostlehood. Ganishka is lowered into a mass of sewn together apostles to surpass his limitations. Daiba states he made this vessel himself, a man-made behalot, if you will. With the Emperor submerging his reincarnated body inside the vessel, from the bowels of the astral world will something unbelievably sinister come about. With the fog gone, Laban urges the inhabitants to head toward the cathedral. Laban and his men enter the Windham Castle and encounter women prisoners, whom they intend to rescue. Upon reaching Foss and the others, Laban instructs everyone to dress up as Kushan soldiers to escape Windham. Upon escaping, the Kushan guards question Laban's name and affiliation. Though he's in trouble for the moment, a Kushan horseman by the name of Jeriff covers for him and reveals he's part of the Band of the Hawk Espionage Division. 
Salant and the Bagiraka stymie Laban's advance, calling Jeref a traitor. Jeref, unfazed, reveals Salat's intentions to return to the land of his birth and establish a foothold in the Imperial Army. Henceforth, Jeref offers Salat a position in the Band of the Hawk. Salat is skeptical, but Jeref claims the Hawk will bring about a new world, one no one has ever seen. Salat has no reasonable refutation, but queries, is it right to yield oneself to something inscrutable. Salat vows to watch from the sidelines for now. Afterwards, Laban meets up with Owen after safely traversing the Kushan encampment and sees his new leader in the distance. Daiba runs in terror from the transformed emperor. In the infernal abyss, I obtained it. Power. The demon emperor obliterates Windham in the blink of an eye. Daiba claims, it's overflowing. Hell is overflowing. Ganishka draws the attention of everyone in the surrounding area as he transforms into an obelisk-like monster with large tentacles. The reason of the world ends now. Farnese and Shirka continue their training until the witch senses the ominous presence. Gut sees the Behalet reconfigure its face and wonders what's happening. Shirka then remarks, It's like... Just like the world is tearing apart. Ganishka's body is a sight beyond words. He begins walking forward, crushing everything beneath his massive feet. The pontiff claims Ganishka, the embodiment of darkness, will be driven away by the Hawk of Light. The dark energy swirling around the demon emperor is a hellstorm. Daiba attempts to reason with Ganishka, but the emperor can think of nothing else but killing others. Emperor Ganishka of the Kushan Empire was an apostle. His desire was to extend the territory under his control to every corner of the world, then surpass and transcend the God Hand, beings who stand above the apostles. To this end, he joined the bodies of captured apostles to build an artificial reincarnation vessel, produced a force of demon beast, and grouped them together with humans from lands he ruled to populate a large army. He then challenged Griffith, who was far beyond his level. Realizing that he could currently do nothing against Griffith, Ganishka lowered himself into the reincarnation vessel in an attempt at a second reincarnation. Thus he was reborn as a towering demonic beast that stood practically as tall as the sky. However, his ego imploded, and he began to attack any enemy or ally in his path. What will Griffith and his new Band of the Hawk do in the face of this giant beast? Ganishka is in a delusional state of mind. He even thinks that the soldiers he's crushing are insects, and that they are blooming into red flowers. Daiba attempts to reason with the deranged emperor, but Ganishka thinks he's just another noisy bug. The devastation caused by the emperor is beyond words. Due to his imploded ego, Daiba analogizes Ganishka's rampage with the deity who destroys the world with fire, Shiva himself. In a confused state, Ganishka then wonders where his soldiers are. Who am I? Isn't anyone there? Somebody, somebody be there. The surrounding humans witnessing the event feel as though this is the end of the world. Off in the distance, Ganishka sees a bird-like light heading his way. He's then reminded of why he's doing what he's doing. The soldiers crushed by Ganishka spawn into grotesque, monstrous beings. The swarm of monsters make their way toward the band of the hawk. Griffith instructs his army to assume the Echelon Formation. Griffith asks the Lords of Midland and the Volunteers to protect the Pontiff, Princess Charlotte, and the other people of Windham. Griffith orders Sonia and Mule to stay with His Holiness. Although, Sonia wants to be by Griffith's side. The Ganishka spawn creatures bear down on the soldiers. Demonic Release
What is this? The war demons! The surrounding people are petrified by what they are seeing. It's clear that ordinary men stand no chance against the demon-like creatures. They then wonder why Griffith is leading such demons into battle. You idiots! Yells Sonia. Mule falls off his horse in surprise as Sonia glares at the others with a stern face. Lightning storms and a massive hurricane of death surround Ganishka's towering body. Sonia makes an appeal to the people of Midland, pointing out that both demons and humans are fighting besides Griffith the Hawk making them all members of the Band of the Hawk. She charges forward into one of the Ganishka monsters. Irvine then intervenes by gashing into it with his lance multiple times. Sonia then falls off her horse into Irvine's arms. You go to such extremes. Irvine points out that Sonia sounded like a child when she gave that speech. Nonetheless, it seems she has inspired confidence in the human soldiers. All forces heed my word. The war demons are mighty, but even they can't check all the enemies. Griffith instructs them to lure in the monsters that get past the war demons, so they can fire a volley of cannons and arrows at them. The human soldiers of the Band of the Hawk begin taking down the hideous creatures with their combined attacks. Irvine and Sonya watch the humans take down the Ganishka monsters. Due to the dangerous nature of the situation, Irvine instructs Sonya to get off, yet she outright refuses. In that case, keep your head down and hold on tight. Sonya grabs on tightly as she and Irvine leap over the human soldiers. After landing, a string appears between the antlers of Irvine's apostle form. He yanks several hairs from his tail, intertwines them, and then loads up the arrow in a makeshift bow. After destroying one of the creatures, he readies three more arrows at the same time and fires away with extreme precision. The band of the hawk cheers Irvine on with Sonya leading the charge forward. Harpy-like beings begin attacking the Ganishka monsters. The human forces then use their numbers advantage to surround the monsters on all sides. They gash into them with their spears and shoot them with their crossbows. Beast and men, wolves and sheep, holy and wicked, dream and reality, life and death. They were now hand in hand. Daiba flies over the battlefield in his Garuda, shocked by the revelation that humans and apostles are fighting side by side. Daiba notes that apostles are infernal reincarnations of those with extreme ego and desire. They are, in fact, twisted, resurrected monstrosities who met death at the brink of karma. Yet, they now fight with men, not because they are forced to, but because they want to. Laban and the Arklo Knights stand ready to defend his holiness, the Pontiff, at all cost. The Pontiff says that people fear the unknown. People must cope with the world because of the unknown. Paganism, foreign languages, different races, and so is that which proves that all this is mere child's play. Because of fear, they label outsiders, all manner of social classes. Everything that separates people is here at this place. The ultimate unknown, yet, why is everyone here filled with exaltation? What a radiant chaos this is. Griffith's horse stands tall as the leader of the Band of the Hawk points his troops forward. Griffith leads the charge in a full-on assault of the enemy. But to everyone's surprise, Emperor Ganishka has made his grand arrival on the battlefield. We then have a flashback to an undetermined time, when Ganishka was a mere six-year-old child. The boy nearly survived after his mother poisoned his drink. This was all a means to clear the way for the younger brother to assume the throne. In the dead of night, Ganishka exacts his revenge by stabbing his little brother to death. After seeing the horrid sight, the mother commits suicide by leaping out of the balcony. 
Despite eliminating the threat of his mother, the royalty and aristocracy were keen on eliminating him. He managed to survive that den of vipers. Ganishka's father, the king, was filled with unrelenting fear and suspicion. One day, on a royal visit, the king's elephant is hit by a poisonous dart, causing it to go berserk. In its rampage, the elephant throws the king to death. It turns out that Ganishka was working with the man who fired the dart. In a tie-up loose ends, he slits his throat. Despite his ascension to the throne, however, he knew no peace. Ganishka, henceforth, devoted his mind and body to war. I had to inspire fear. Fear far greater than my own. Ganishka then took in a wife from the royalty of a neighboring kingdom, and he even had a son. But with his mind solely preoccupied with war, he never had the chance to look at his family. No, I feared it. The idea of mother and child. Ganishka fought in a battlefield for many months and years. At some point, the ambition to reign supreme over the world possessed me. It was as if no amount of blood could ever paint over my irreconcilable fear. Upon returning to the palace for a banquet, Ganishka is poisoned once again, this time by his own son. Ganishka notes that his son's eyes reflected what his looked like back then, when he murdered his own father. Ganishka attempts to escape from the guards, but they gash into him multiple times with their spears. Ganishka reaches for an oddly shaped item, which turns out to be a bailet, causing it to activate and bestow him with a new apostle form. Life, the world, it's all darkness. In the all-engulfing darkness, you fear, you instill fear, you writhe and creep. Listlessness, that is life. Ganishka opens up his eyes to a blinding light. It's warm, but I can't touch it. I'll be burned. You can see, because he who bears light exists in the deepest shadow. And it's within darkness that true light is discovered. Just then, the Sword of Actuation cuts into the proceedings opening up a portal for the Knight of Skeleton to enter in, just behind Griffith, aka Femto. Skull Knight raises a sword of Baelitz upwards and slashes down at Femto's body. Upon seeing this, Zod goes berserk, attacking the Skull Knight with intense fury. Skull Knight dodges the attack. I was waiting for you. The one who targets the God Hand at temporal juncture points. The Knight of Skeleton. Femto distorted space, curving the sword so it missed him and sliced into the deeper layers of the spirit world. A metaphorical door has now opened up, where Ganishka's face used to exist.
Amongst villages, cities, nations, and peoples, for centuries, for millennia, stories have been told about them as if they really exist. People fear them, yearn for them, yet cannot catch or escape them. Thus have they gone of imagining this other half of the world, and it now lies before their eyes. Mankind's desire, Fantasia. Like the northern tree of myth, piercing the heavens and reaching to the ends of the earth, like the eastern tree of sutra, where the sage meets with enlightenment, like the western tree of ritual, signifying the reason of all creation. As if it were the origin rooted deep within all of mankind, it was like the very essence of tree itself. The surrounding people wonder if this is the legendary city that sank beneath Windham long ago. It truly is Falconia, capital of the Hawk. Elsewhere, Bonebeard's crew searches for Roderick's seahorse. One of the men advises Bonebeard to give up on the chase due to limited supplies and a possible mutiny. The captain, however, is hell-bent on continuing the chase, reminding his men that rage will fill their bellies. They then wonder about the strange wind that seemed to have blown through their bodies. Rumors are spreading about gigantic shadows crossing beneath the surfaces, possibly ghosts or even monsters. Bonebeard scoffs at this notion. If those things really do exist, wouldn't I have been haunted to death ages ago? The next morning, a bird controlled by Shirka flies above the water's surface. A serpent-like creature rises up and snaps at the bird, yet it's caught by an even larger serpent-like beast. The bird lands on the windowsill, only to see Puck and Isidro drawing all over Shirka's unconscious body. Shirka transfers her consciousness from the bird back to her own body again. Explain yourselves! yells Shirka as she whacks Isidro on the head with her staff. Farnese walks in, wondering if this is a new ritual for one of her spells. On the ship's deck, Roderick notices Bonebeard's boat in the distance, though he wonders why he's gaining on him with the damage they experienced in the last battle. Roderick urges everyone to return to the ship's hold. Casca's brand begins to bleed, as Shirka mentions that those who are chasing them are something other than human. Roderick worries that these monsters are going to be similar to the ones in Virtanis. Roderick brings the ship to port and readies the cannons for a continuous volley against the enemy. Cannonballs are fired against the enemy, but Bonebeard's boat submerges below the water's surface to avoid them. Roderick comes to the conclusion that this is no ordinary ship, but something from legend, a ghost ship. In the ship's cabin, Guts' brand begins to bleed, prompting him to reattach his arm cannon and prepare for battle. Bonebeard attempts to capsize Roderick's boat from below the surface, but thanks to some quick maneuvering on Roderick's part, the plan fails. 
Roderick urges everyone to prepare for hand-to-hand -hand combat. Swords are passed out. Shirka senses that the ship itself is some kind of dark creature. Boombeard then reintroduces himself, though his physical appearance seems to have taken a different form. Once he realizes who he's fighting though, he quickly gnaws on the wood of his boat in fear. After regaining his composure, he states, We retired from the being human business. A horde of tentacle-like monsters, devils of the deep as it were, emerge from the watery depths to greet Roderick's crew. It turns out that these are Bonebeard's brethren, and they're searching for new prey. One of the monsters snags onto Roderick's men and swallows him whole. Eat up, me hotties! The monsters attack with the crew members losing their composure. The monsters invade all parts of the ship, terrifying everyone in sight. In an instant, numerous monsters are sliced to pieces, shocking Bonebeard. You know what? I'm starving. Tell me, are these things edible? The gang is excited to see Guts in action, as he cleaves his way through the monsters as if they were butter. Bonebeard is in utter disbelief from this show of strength and brutality. Turns out, Guts is only half awake, worrying that he might destroy the ship or kill someone by accident. Whoever doesn't want to die better hit the deck. Guts rampages through the monsters with relative ease. Bonebeard wonders how the tables could have turned so easily. However, he then summons the main dish, as it were. This behemoth is the main monster itself, meaning the tentacles Guts destroyed up until now were only its whiskers. Unfazed, Guts uses his cannon to propel himself with the recoil, to slice across the monster's core with his dragon slayer. The others are stunned by what they saw, with Isidro dubbing the attack, Cannon Spin Slash. Guts is pleased that his sword hasn't gotten rusty from the sea breeze. Bonebeard looks to have another trick up his sleeve, yet Roderick commands his men to fire the cannons before this comes to fruition. Bonebeard continues to threaten them, with sweat beating down his face. One of the crew members then mentions that the sun is rising, forcing them to submerge below the surface once more. Roderick's crew praises Guts for his proficiency with the sword. Roderick mentions that he's in Guts' debt, but the Black Swordsman tells him to consider this compensation for the boat ride. The Navigator reports that the hull has sprung several leaks from the last battle, necessitating them to stop at a nearby island for inspection and repairs. Amongst the jagged rocks of the island stands a small girl with a fishing net and a spear. Upon landing, Shirka senses that something is off about the island. Guts notes that his brand of sacrifice has been acting weird lately, ever since that wind passed through them. It's like a wound that won't close, like it's gotten too sensitive, so now it just feels numb instead. Shirka senses an ominous OD on the island. Roderick then announces that they'll depart tomorrow morning after the ship's repairs are done. Isidro takes the opportunity to explore the island with glee. Him and Puck then approach a mysterious cave. That cave's bad news. You shouldn't go near it says the unknown girl. Surprisingly, the girl notices Puck on top of Istro's head. She mentions that the cave is taboo, since the sea guy lives in there. The main cohort then enters the town, but the inhabitants shut the doors and windows without a single utterance. Shirka senses a vague OD covering the entire village, but has no idea what this means. Casca pulls away from Farnese to stare at a small, cryptic statue inside a shrine. Istrio becomes nervous thinking about a possible sea god. The girl claims it's a sinister, dreadful god that sinks ships and eats people. Istrio then gains a new level of confidence to explore inside, but he quickly gets scared and drops his dagger. The girl decides to invite Isidro to her house. In the village, Shirka alleges that this is a statue of an ancient god. When the doctrine of religion spread throughout the world, the ancient gods were forgotten and cast away to the astral realm. Shirka decides to walk around the island for a bit to gather more information. Roderick offers an officer for protection, but the witch is fine on her own. Isidro warms up by the fire as she's shocked to see the girl without any clothing on. She applies a salve to Isidro's wound, yet she gives him a nosebleed in the process. You know, a nosebleed. I'm Isma. Nice to meet you. The girl invites Isidro to dinner and encourages him to recount her with his travels. Meanwhile, the main crew sits down for a bite to eat. Guts notices that the people look a bit odd. The worker then asks them to serve themselves as he gets something from the back room. Shirka enters the mysterious cave where Isidro once was. This is the purported cave where the sea god lives. She finds Isidro's salamander dagger on the ground. The tentacle-like monsters from the ghost ship then emerge. Shirka uses her thought transference to see through Isidro's eyes. Unfortunately, she sees Isma's breast. The monsters initiate their attack. Meanwhile, Isma inquires about Isidro's travels. Isidro embellishes a bit about his accomplishments, and Isma believes every word of his. Shirka barges in all wet and covered with seaweed. 
This is a rare item. You really need to be more responsible with it. Shirka had a horrible time with the tentacle monsters. Isma invites Shirka to warm up by the fire as her boobs smush into Istro's face. Shirka then stares at the girl, coming to the realization that this girl has something to do with the ocean. Shirka and Ivalera introduce themselves to Isma. Shirka inquires about information regarding the island. Isma says she's a fisherman, and this island is isolated from sea routes and any other land. The only people who stop here are broken ships. The villagers don't like strangers, and Isma can't stand the villagers. Isma is the village outcast, because the other villagers are scared of her. You see, I'm a Mero. The girl plays this off as a joke. Turns out her dad was with a Mero, but she's been gone ever since Isma can remember. After her dad's boat was capsized, he said her mom would return to her one day. The various decorations around the house are Mero charms, but Isma's not sure if she believes in any of that. Shirka mentions that Mero are good omens, so she wonders why the people detest them. Isma says a really long time ago, a terrible sea god rampaged throughout the sea. The Meros challenged the sea god to a war. Despite losing many comrades, they confined the sea god to this island. As full moons approach, the sea god stretches its tentacles and attacks nearby ships and people. Afraid of rousing its anger, the islanders despise the Mero. So, is that a sea god? Says Isidro, referring to the tentacles. Yes, replies Shirka. Isma notes that the villagers don't look like humans lately, and some strange sounds have been coming from the sea god's cave. It's like the world's all gone bizarre ever since that strange wind blew through. After dinner, Roderick decides to check in on the ship. He opens the front door, only to find the strange village people standing outside. We warmly welcome you as our guest. Tonight is a full moon, and it's a special one. It's the Easter of the Sea God, the lord of this island. Guts tosses a dagger into the monster's eye. A tentacle-like monster then emerges. Guts slices it vertically with his dragon slayer. Great, this welcome's a bit too warm. The black swordsman walks outside, only to be greeted by a horde of tentacle monsters. Shirka senses something involving the tentacle monsters. Instead, she needs to get going. Isma offers to accompany them since she knows a shortcut to the village. Gut starts slicing through the barrage of tentacle-like monsters with his dragon slayer. Serpico helps slice them up with his sylphs. This is indeed a full moon. The sylph sword seems more powerful than usual. Farnese utilizes her thorn snakes, with Roderick impaling one with his sword. I'm surprised to learn octopi can change into humans, says Serpico. Can't say it makes me want to eat any more of them, replies Guts. It appears the entire village has been turned into monsters. Guts continues gashing into the monsters. Serpico can't get through their thick tentacles with his sylphs. Guts presses forward nonetheless, by slicing a huge one in half. The black swordsman takes a moment to recover, but is quickly surrounded by a horde of sea slugs. Can you kill them all without using that power? Says the Beast of Darkness. Shirka receives a mental image of the monsters, instructing Isidro that they need to move quickly. Isma abruptly stops, pointing down at the Sea God Cave. Something's climbing up the cliff! Guts continues slicing up the monsters to pieces. He shoots his arm cannon to blast one of the larger monsters to smithereens. How many times am I gonna fire this thing today? I'm gonna have to charge you for the powder and shots, Captain. You can have a whole keg's worth, replies Roderick. The sheer number of monsters has blocked all their exits, and Guts is showing signs of fatigue. Magnifico recommends that Guts use his berserker armor, but Farnese vehemently declines, saying that the risk is far too high. The ghost ship climbing the rocks earlier makes landfall in front of Guts' party, and it is none other than Bonebeard and his crew. Impossible! A ship on land? That is just too absurd! Yo ho 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 ho! Absurd is what we do! Once Bonebeard locks his eyes on a target, he never gives up. Gut shows admiration for the pirate's ingenuity and his dedication. Humans who get eaten turn into tentacles, literal hands and feet for the sea god. This ship will devour you, and you'll be brethren of the sea, just like us. Bonebeard explains that they ran out of time in their last battle, since the monsters return to their den when the sun comes out. But because tonight is a full moon, it'll bring out the full power of the sea god. Once they're swallowed up and digested, they'll be turned into brethren, and that's when the fun begins. Guts enters a state of rage as his internal beast of darkness begins to stir. No! Wait! At least wait until I'm there! Guts looks over at Casca as the hood of the berserker armor envelops his head. Farnese urges him to stop, but it's already too late.
Yasuma, Isidro, and Chirika walk in on the proceedings as the young witch looks nervous to see Guts in his berserker armor. Guts and the crew were forced to dock at the island, where legends of a sea god and marrows persist. But it was a monstrous place, where the inhabitants had been transformed into tentacles for the sea god. The god was overwhelmingly powerful, having even turned a pirate ship into a tentacle. And Guts had no choice but to once again don the berserker armor. Isma is shocked to see that monsters like this really exist. The girl worries about the safety of the villagers. She then approaches two of the village brats. Join us! We'll make you one of us! Isidro leaps into action with his salamander dagger. Shirka uses her fiery hairs to finish off the monsters. Isidro is surprised by the strength of the magic, but Puck explains that it's due to the fact that it's a full moon. Besides their companions, Shirka senses no human presence in the village. Because of the amulet surrounding Isma's house, she was spared from the evil presence. Though Isma hated the other villagers, she now realizes that she's all alone. Isma wants to help the two out, but Isidro advises against it, since she'll be watching the people she knew getting all hacked up. You should think twice. At this point, you'd only get in the way down there, says Shirka, talking to Isidro. I was being nihilistic, and you ruined it, replies Isidro. The witch notes that Guts maintained a state of mind in Virtanis because she modulated his rage. So she'll need to possess him again with her luminous body to prevent him from completely losing it here and now. She closes her eyes and sends out her luminous body. Unfortunately, the armor's OD is too powerful, repelling her back and into her physical body. Meanwhile, Guts' consciousness fades into the darkness, as he becomes indistinguishable from a wild beast. Bonebeard frets over the developments, wondering what they should do next. While Guts slices his way through the sea monsters, Casca runs off from the group. Farnese chases after her, as Guts catches a glimpse of their shadowy forms. Farnese uses her silver dagger to take out one of the tentacles. Casca then shields a small child as the sea monster bears down on them. Guts swoops in at the last moment to slice up the creature. He then stares down at Casca and the child. Isma, Isidro, and Chirko enter the area, as Serpko understands that Guts still hasn't returned to his proper state of mind. Now what? What do we do? The Beast of Darkness urges him to give in to violence, as his consciousness fights back. Yield yourself. Look, says a mysterious voice. Focus your gaze here. Look. Casca's face becomes visible as a human engulfed in light touches his chest. That's right. You know this. You mustn't lose it. You mustn't destroy it. Guts resists the dark influence of the armor's OD and his internal beast of darkness. Shirka, not wanting to miss her opportunity, leaps onto his back and utters a spell that brings him back to reality. Shirka is then thrown back as the Black Swordsman urges her to never do anything like that again. You saved me though. I owe you one. Shirka blushes from the compliment as Isma marvels in the witch's bravery. The crew looks over at Casca to see her embracing the Moonlight Boy. You says a perplexed Guts. Shirka notes that he showed up the last time there was a full moon, and that nights like this with full moons have deep magical significance and are full of magical power. Guts then wonders if the boy is the magical entity that stopped him from attacking Casca. Isma hands the Moonlight Boy a blanket as she introduces herself to the others. She starts crying when she realizes that she is the last person on the island. Roderick allows Isma to travel with them as the girl is excited to be on a big boat. Roderick makes preparations to leave the island, but Guts claims there's still something they need to do. We'll settle things here on the island. Isma states that the place of origin of all the tentacles is inside the Sea God's cave. Shirka recommends that they head back to the seahorse to make preparations for their battle. Guts then stares at the cryptic child, just for a moment though. Back at the seahorse, Shirka has Farnese sit down on the deck. I will cast the formation of the four? Says a perplexed Farnese. How can the Vandemayan be some kind of a witch? replies Magnifico. Because Shirka must travel with Guts in her luminous form, it falls upon Farnese to provide the key defense to the ship. Though the formation of the four is powerful, it's a rather basic spell, ideal for a first-timer like Farnese. Farnese then looks up at Guts for reassurance. The two mages synchronize their rhythms. I am a mage. I am the key defense. O blessed king of the east, whose spirit rises over the mountains as a zephyr, and whose golden raiment gleams like the sun. O blessed king from the west, whose mane rambles even the water spirits, who caper beneath the waves. O blessed king of the south, brilliance greater than everlasting flame in thy majesty. O blessed king of the north, it is for thy rule that all living beings of earth rejoice. I feel how enormous the thing is of which I'm a part. The others stare on in awe at what Farnese was able to accomplish. 
Well done, says Shirka. I did this? Says Farnese. Serpico congratulates Farnese as the black swordsman walks up. It's your watch. You're our shield. A tear streams down her face, saying she won't let them down. It's now time for Guts and Shirka to get a move on. Shirka wishes to oppose the sea god with magic alone, but the OD blowing out of the cave is far too powerful, necessitating Guts' involvement. Despite this, she won't allow the Berserker armor to possess him. Guts squats down as Shirka climbs on his back. Even if Guts maintains his consciousness, the toll on his body will be severe. Damn, it's such a pain to restrain this thing, but you can summon it at the drop of a freaking hat. It's like a starving beast, snapping at bait. Shirka enters her luminous form as Serpco catches her body. The witch notes that the beast of darkness has grown in power, but I will restrain it. Despite the hood enveloping his head, Guts is thinking straight. Well, at least straight enough not to know who to bite. Guts leaps across some rocks as the Moonlight Boy hears some voices. Isma hears the same voices as Istro wonders what she's talking about. Guts' brand begins to bleed as Shirka notes that whatever's inside the cave is awake now. The Sea God. <laughs> Guts' night vision is improved with the Berserker armor on, as he's reminded of the feeling that he had at Quithoth. Shirka can't power the power of the spirits from here, since the Sea God's powerful spiritual pressure blocks it. Yeah, it does look like we're descending into the depths of hell. The two come upon a stone statue from an ancient culture. They enter the Sea God shrine, as the sea slugs emerge from every direction. Come into my house! Ye be most welcome here in me abode! Though Guts' fighting style is inhuman, Bonebeer claims they'll never run out of new soldiers. Strain those eyes! Follow the faint light emitted from me, brethren, and peer into the depths of the darkness. Then know that what you gaze upon be pure despair. The massive sea god comes into their field of vision. The spiritual pressure emitted by the sea god is immense, making Shirka wonder how they'll battle such a gigantic foe. No chow down, brethren! Shirka urges Guts to fall back to a narrower part of the cave. That way they can fight the monsters one on one. But Guts refuses, saying they're going one way and one way only. Straight into the sea god itself. Guts uses Bonebeard's face as a launching pad as he flies over the barrage of monsters. Guts slices through the monsters, telling Shirka to hold on. Out of the way, I'm trying to jump into that freakishly huge maw. Guts sprints his way up the tentacle towards the wide gaping mouth. The black swordsman jumps in as Bonebeard laughs at him. It's the climax of the festival. Let's be on our way. Inside the sea god, Guts finds a collection of broken down ships. Shirka notes that the tentacles pull in its victims and makes them a part of itself. The two notice the sound of the sea god's heart. That's a pulse? Well, actually I suppose it is. With the sound echoing all over the place, Guts is having trouble locating the heart. Shirka follows the OD and points Guts in the right direction. Stomach acid fills the room as a horde of parasites rush towards them. One of Roderick's crew spots Bonebeard's boat. While Farnese protects Shirka's body, Roderick fires the cannons at the enemy's ship. Pay it no mind! Full speed ahead, me hearties! With Farnese's barrier holding strong, Roderick takes full advantage, blasting them to bits. Bonebeard rolls right over the monsters, calling out their incompetence. Because the pirates are physical substances of this world, the barrier is only half as effective. The pirate ship henceforth rams into them. Now we can finally get down to some swashbuckling! Isidro belittles Bonebeard's crew as he takes command of the men on Roderick's boat. What do you dogs know about a tentacle's feelings? Can it, you slimy creep? The two opposing sides engage in battle as Guts fends off the endless barrage of parasites. The two run out of the room with Guts leaping off the mast of the ship to gash into the stomach's lining of the sea god. That should do it. The pressurized gas comes gushing out like a burp. When the two enter the new area, they come across more parasites, these ones resembling long-legged spiders. Meanwhile, Bonebeard urges his men to overwhelm Roderick's crew. Serpico utilizes his sylphs, with Azan proving his mettle. I'm the Black Mustachioed Knight! Remember that! Farnese deploys her thorn snakes, as Casca watches over Shirka and the Moonlight Boy. Bonebeard berates his men, but then Isidro lunges in, forcing the captain to defend. Boy! 
Time to knock you into the sea again. Bonebeard quickly becomes nervous, noting Eastro's sharpened skills. The boy grabs a wicker basket and slams it over Bonebeard's head. He then aims for the pirate with his sword, but Bonebeard manages to block it. Impressed by his underhanded tactics, Bonebeard offers the boy a job as a pirate. Isidro declines. The pirate then aims a crossbow straight at him. Isma tosses a divider into the forehead of the pirate, causing Bonebeard to miss Isidro. Time to go for broke! Show him what tentacles are made of! Isidro sees Isma throwing provisions at the pirates, so he gets a bright idea. He lights the materials up with fire and tosses them into the mouth of the tentacles. As Bonebeard threatens them, the makeshift explosives burst inside the sea monsters. Scared of dying again, the pirates tuck their tails between their legs and run away. Roderick's crew then celebrate their victory. Farnese, the seahorse's guardian angel! Now, the rest depends on Guts and Shirka. After eliminating the many parasites, Guts walks ever closer to the heart. My gut. No, my whole damn body feels numb. You can bet if I stayed here too long, the pulse alone would kill me with madness. Guts' breathing is labored due to the heavy, stagnant air. The pulse grows more intense, eliciting physical pain in the Black Swordsman. The Moonlight Boy begins acting strange. Isma feels a terrible chill as the Moonlight Boy points towards the cliffside. Despite the pain, Guts finally reaches the heart. Outside, the sea god explodes through the side of the cliff. Guts and Shirka's path is impeded by a horde of serpent-like monsters. It's a sea god, alright. Right. This feels just like the ocean floor. Bonebeard's crew loses all sense of humanity as they're transformed into tentacles. The sea god hoists up the pirate ship as the tentacles pervade the entire area. Isma is in disbelief that her home is sinking. Roderick instructs everyone to cling on to something as a gigantic wave comes crashing in. If this god thing's on the move, we don't have any time to waste. Isidro is tossed off the boat, forcing Isma to jump in after him. She grabs the boy, but has to move fast, since the tentacles are quickly approaching. Isma then hears a strange voice. Speak. Chant. Say it. Say the name. The name given to you that you know not. Your one and only true name. Name. My true name. <laughs> Isma, along with two other Mero, leap onto the seahorse. Did you just... Whoa! Fish! Isma is thrilled to have a fish tail. That stuff my pa told me! It was true! The crew is shocked to see a real-life Mero, as Roderick instructs them to load the cannons once again. Isma says by saying her true name, she turned into a Mero. Ivalera warns her not to repeat it in front of other people. Otherwise, if she does, other people will have control over her. Isma, however, seems unconcerned about this, as a pervy Magnifico listens in. Seriously, what's this guy doing? She's like 14. A school of marrow swim beneath the ship, shocking everyone aboard. Guts continues hacking his way through the eel-like monsters. Are you alright? Yeah, your mistress heirloom is really something. They won't bite through it like some crab or lobster shell. The bloodbath persists on, but then the heart beats once more, causing blood to spill out of his eyes, ears, and mouth. Roderick's crew see the marrow heading straight to the sea god. It was all true! The legend! And what Pa told me! I'm going too! This is my island! And Meryl fight against the Sea God! Despite being fearful of the monstrous Sea God, Roderick commands his crew to get within firing range. The Meryl in the area spread out, beginning their attack on the tentacles. 
Target that huge leviathan, says Roderick. The clouds and water swirl around the sea god as lightning storms ensue. It almost seems to be mimicking the eclipse itself. Water sprays onto the ship as Istra worries about Isma. Awesome! I can breathe underwater! Isma wonders how the Meryl will defeat all these creatures as she finds herself in a precarious position. Another Meryl grabs her hand and pulls her to safety. I sang. Meryl's fight using song. Welcome home, Isma. The girl is stunned to finally meet her own mother. Shirka hears the cannon fire outside, meaning the others are still safe. Guts can't see or hear at this point, asking Shirka to point him in the right direction. He's finished off all the fish monsters, so all he needs to do is walk up to the heart and slash. Shirka guides him to the heart, but the booming pulse puts him on his back. You can't take any more, yells Shirka. We're the ones who have it cornered. Yet, Guts is thrown on his back once more. None of his senses are working, as his whole body feels numb. Is that singing? The Marrow starts singing in unison, eliciting pain in the Sea God. Roderick's crew watches on as the Sea God begins to flounder. I hear singing coming from the sea, says Isidro. As the Marrow sing, the Sea God itself looks like a dark abyss with a brilliant light inside. Definitely looks like some symbolism, perhaps alluding to the idea of evil itself. Shirka notes that the Marrow's singing is making the Sea God tremble. In fact, it's negating the pulse. Come on! You need to stand up, Guts! Hey, says the Beast of Darkness. I know, you haven't had your fill yet. This is pretty lazy, seeing as you always talk such a big game. Quit laying down on the job. Get up and pierce some flesh and bone. Let me feel the pain. After Guts slashes through the heart, the Sea God deflates into the sea, with the crew members cheering on their victory. Shirka returns to her physical body, however, she's worried about Guts' safety since he's still trapped within the Sea God. Shirka urges Roderick to bring the seahorse close to the Sea God. The others wonder why she's recommending this. She tells them that Guts is hurt badly and cannot move at the moment. The impact of the blood knocks Shirka out of his body, leaving Guts all by himself. Isma approaches the seahorse, introducing the crew to her mom. The Marrow states that the Sea God is sinking, and soon enough, sea dragons will be here to feed on its carcass. The Marrow's offer to help in finding Guts. Shirka cannot enter her luminous body at the moment due to physical exhaustion. Meanwhile, Guts is trapped in the darkness. I can't see anything. Is it because it's dark, or is it my eyes? Guts realizes that Shirka is no longer with him. He struggles to breathe, so he slices upwards to escape. Unfortunately, blood fills the area. Is this it? Here? In this muck? Is this how it ends? The luminous body of the Moonlight Boy descends upon him and points the way towards salvation. Roderick, Isidro, and Serpco enter the Sea God's mouth. Shirka's thought transference is not working at the moment, as the Marrows attempt to use sonar to find guts. With the Sea God sinking ever deeper, Roderick's crew is forced to abandon their rescue mission. Just what are you? You show up when things get rough. Why are you frolicking around? You're like some playful kid. As Guts cuts, seawater pours in. Several hands grab his arm as he's pulled out of the Sea God. The Marrow then flagged down Roderick's crew as the Moonlight Boy stares on. 
The Marrows swim alongside the seahorse, guiding it to Skellig Island. Yzma explains they're doing this out of gratitude for their assistance in fighting the sea god. Meanwhile, Casca and the Moonlight Boy go to bed as Shirka and Farnese tend to Guts' wounds. The young witch suspects that Guts is deaf, but he verifies that his senses are still working. Farnese manipulates Guts' OD to accelerate the healing process. The process makes Guts feel warm as Farnese feels a sense of belonging. Serpka watches the proceedings through the door as he sees Casca wandering about. Farnese approaches Casca, who is moaning loudly. Puck announces that the Moonlight Boy is missing. Everyone on the boat helps out in finding the boy, but it's to no avail. Shirka notes that the boy always shows up during full moons, when magical powers are at their strongest. The witch postulates that the boy is either an emissary for Skellig Island or the Flower Storm Monarch. While Guts lies in bed, his hand shakes as he notices a deterioration in his vision, all of which foretold by the Skull Knight. Guts dismisses this and begins to fall asleep. Guts then remembers Skull Knight's warning that his wish may not coincide with Casca's. After being reminded of the eclipse, he thinks of Griffith. The Black Swordsman stares up at the moon. Off in the distance, the Moonlight Boy stands on one of the branches for the World Spiral Tree. He then flies off into the distance like a shooting star. A group of caravans race through the forest. Faster! They're catching up! A horde of trolls chase them down. Rickard unveils a repeating crossbow, similar to Guts, that he shoots to take down the trolls. Erica loads in more arrows, but there's too many at the moment. The crossbow string snaps, so Erica tosses a box of tacks at the trolls. A rotted tree blocks their path. Just before the trolls reach them, however, Irvine fires several arrows at the monstrous creatures. The Band of the Hawk, led by Laban, come in and finish off the trolls. Rickard is shocked to see the Band of the Hawk insignia. <laughs> A cock tries bellows loudly, scaring everyone in sight. The bird-like monster grabs a soldier with its beak, but then an arrow pierces its eye and he lets him go. Irvine leaps down and fires another arrow, yet this one is blown off course by the cockatrice's breath. Irvine, henceforth, transforms into his apostle form. You are my prey. You won't escape. Irvine fires the arrow straight at the cockatrice's mouth, killing the creature on the spot. Though Rickard acknowledges that Irvine saved his life, he's still apprehensive towards the apostle. He then hears that Griffith employs the apostles in the new band of the hawk. Laban's soldiers move the rotted tree blocking the caravan. The convoy gets a move on as Rickert repairs his crossbow. The boy then recalls the day when Griffith appeared on the Hill of Swords alongside Zod. During that time, Griffith exuded a familiar, yet new presence. Numerous harpies approach the caravan, but Rickert fends them off with his crossbow. Laban exalts the boy as Rickert remembers him from the night that Griffith faked his own death. The two reminisce about the Hundred Year War and how it seems mild compared to what's happening now. They eventually reach some oddly shaped crystal formations. They are called wingstones, and they serve to ward off evil. Rickards, Erica, and the others stare on in awe at the world spiral tree. Laban explains that the trees, grains, and flowers are always able to be harvested. Truly a blessing from God. As they approach Falconia, Laban explains that it's a place where people can live their lives as people. The city itself is magnificent. Rickard notes that Windham did not have as many people as Falconia. A group of Kushans are informed by Sonia to save a group of refugees that are on their way to Falconia. This surprises Rickards and the others since the Kushans are supposed to be their enemies. Rickards and Erica are then brought to a refugee processing station. Before they get through the paperwork, Laban brings Rickard to his office and presents him with a letter of recommendation for several local guilds. He tells Rickard to also visit Griffith, presenting him with a writ to do so. Afterwards, they go to an inn and meet Luke. Luca, Pepe, Fouquet, and Lucy. They are taken to the inn stable 
stable, where they meet an old, hooded man. Lucas states that a monster lives in the stable, so the old man tends to the matter. Erica then goes to a bathhouse with the other girls. Erica states that her and Rickert used to live in the mountains, but due to the constant troll attacks, they were forced to move away to the city. The girls all state they had prophetic visions about the Falcon of Light. At nighttime, Rickard stares up at the citadel where Griffith lives. The next day, Rickard hands over his writ given to him by Laban, which grants him entry. He runs into Owen, captain of the Citadel Guards, who greets Rickard personally. At the moment, Griffith is attending mass. Owen leads Rickard to a large room, with people mourning their dearly departed. The pontiff stands at the dais, along with Sonia, Charlotte, and Griffith. <laughs> Locus appears, telling Rickert that humans in this room are seeing what lies beyond death. Locus deduces that there must be an afterlife if the dead can come back to life like this. Sonia serves as the medium, permitting the living and the dead to communicate with one another. Locus states that the true king is given his rule by a higher power. While this exists in stories and fairy tales, their divine right is dwarfed by Griffith. Two guards inform Owen that two invaders invaded Falconia. As he departs, Locus takes Rickard with him. The apostle takes the boy on a long bridge that leads to a huge black dome. Locus dubs the place Pandemonium. Locus claims that Pandemonium is the domain of war demons. Locus then wonders why Rickard wants to meet Griffith. He eventually determines that the boy is here to question him about the eclipse. Rickard already knows about the eclipse, however. He just wants verification from Griffith himself. The two arrive at the gates of Pandemonium as the door slowly swings open. Daiba frightens Erica and some of the other children, but knee pain prevents him from chasing them down. He then hypnotizes Erica into helping him out with chores and to never enter the barn again. After finishing the chores, Erica presents Daiba with a leg brace, saying it was her father's before he died. Luca asks if the girl made the leg brace, but Erica says it was Rickard's work. He also created small bombs and a repeating crossbow. Erica says that her father forged an enormous sword, but Daiba claims that no person could wield such a weapon. Erica attempts to convince him otherwise, as Daiba and Luca reflect upon their encounters with the Black Swordsman. Inside Pandemonium, gigantic apostles fight each other, while other apostles watch on with glee. Locus tells the horrified Rickard that the apostles were previously human, and were given new bodies through the will of causality. Griffith has given them a place to live, and they act as the fighting force to defend humankind. Thanks to Griffith, humans no longer need to fight each other or fear death. In a gazebo, Griffith, Charlotte, the Pontiff, Sonia, and Mule drink tea and eat cake. The Pontiff must oversee Griffith's consternation before he dies. The conversation shifts to Charlotte and Griffith's upcoming wedding. Frustrated, Sonia demands more cake that she can feed to Mule. Locus and Rickard then arrive in the courtyard. Griffith then walks over to the small bridge where Rickard stands. Rickard contemplates what he should say to Griffith. Although he's created a utopian society, he's also killed all of his friends. Will you still dream the same dream? Have you found an answer to the question on the Hill of Swords, Rickert? Oh! Rickert slaps the leader of Falconia, Griffith, the leader of the Band of the Hawks, and the future king. 
Everyone is in absolute shock, as Locus is seething in rage. Griffith puts his hand up, indicating that he doesn't want anyone to take Rickards away. I was ashamed of myself, that I couldn't go with everyone to Windham to rescue you that day. I felt like I owed a debt, for not getting to share in the fate of others. For being unable to get mad like Guts, or take responsibility like him. For only being able to stand there and watch him go. But then, that hill of swords, the one who made all their grave markers, was me. Have you noticed? The new band of the Hawk Crest. The shape of the wings. It's a little different from the old crest. That it is. I'm Rickert, member of the band of the Hawk, led by Griffith, the White Hawk. My leader isn't the Hawk of Light. Goodbye. Rickert stares up at the Citadel one last time before he leaves as Griffith stares down at him. It would seem I've been rejected. Salat and Locus watch Griffith from the sidelines, with the latter crushing stone with his bare hands, enraged by the disrespect that was shown to his king. Later on, Ricker demonstrates the use of a water pump to a man from Falconia's youth association. He suggests that the pump could be used against fires in the city. Rickard then marvels at the technological advancements of Falconia. Luca makes it a point to acknowledge Rickard's mechanical skills, and how it could be a valuable asset in the city. However, this is not in the cards anymore, since Rickard slapped Griffith in the face. Everyone is absolutely shocked by this. Luca accepts his decision nonetheless, but she worries about Erica's safety. Because Erica considers Rickard family, she cannot leave his side. Luca still urges Rickard to reconsider his decision. Rickard once again marvels at Falconia's industrious nature. In her courtyard, Rickard thinks about Luca's request, eliciting memories of the Band of the Hawk in his mind. Roxas then makes his presence known. Roxas slithers his way down the statue and appears behind Rickard. Even if you're gone, your family can live on in this city, in all comfort, under the Hawk's protection. Die now, free of concern. Abruptly, two Chakram head towards Roxas, forcing him to dodge and release Rickert. A column segment comes flying in as Roxas dodges once more. The objects were thrown by Salat and his Tapasa. Despite Roxas' reasons for wanting the boy dead, Salat needs him alive, since he holds valuable information about Griffith. Salat attempts a dialogue with Rickert, but abandons this notion when the Apostle moves beneath the throne pillar. Salat tosses two Chakram at Roxas, yet the Apostle catches them with his spike. Your skills have improved, young master. He then sends him towards Rickert. The Tapasa intervene by catching the Chakram. They attack Roxas as a tandem, but he traps their legs in his cloak and tosses them with his tendril-like appendages. Despite this, they restrain his arms, leaving him open for a frontal strike, which Salat takes full advantage of by splitting Roxas' mask in half. That's not necessarily where my head is. I like this one too. Sad. Mood's ruined. I'm leaving. I'll go put on a new mask, so bear with me. Tonight, once the moon's risen, I'll come again. Salat threatens to torture Rickard for info if he doesn't reveal what he knows about Griffith. However, Rickard strikes a deal with him that works to his advantage. Rickard returns to Luca with Salat and the Tapasa as Daiba notices them. Later on, Rickard explains what happened earlier and how he needs to leave Falconia tonight. Rickard determines that this is the type of covert activity that is in line with Griffith's personality. Although Griffith is viewed as a benevolent ruler, Rickard knows that he is capable of heinous acts. Luca wonders where Rickert will go. Salat then says, Long before the Kushans invaded this religious sphere, we Bakiraka built a hidden village in an impregnable land, and we've survived for several centuries working as assassins. All who live in the village are warriors, who constantly practice their killing arts. Not even the likes of spirit creatures would find it easy to approach. Salat did ponder the idea of working for Griffith, but ultimately decided that if he had to work for another inhuman creature again, it wouldn't be worth it. Despite the dangers, Rickert wants to bring Erica with him. Rickert then says, Long ago, a friend left on a journey, for the same reason I am now. A dangerous journey, with someone dear to him. Though unlike me, he was an extremely able swordsman who was nearly unkillable. Knowing him, he's still out there somewhere. I'm sure of it. Elsewhere, Roxas, under the full moon, stares down at Falconia from a falcon-shaped statue. Roxas travels across the rooftops, eventually spotting his target. He sneaks up on Rickert, but accidentally trips on a wire and starts a mini fireworks show. Exposed by the light, Rickert shoots the apostle with his crossbow. I got him! I told you, that's not necessarily where my head is. 
replies Roxas. The Apostle feels sadness from another mask being destroyed. He then tosses an arrow into Rickard's shoulder. Rickard was once followed by an Apostle for hundreds of leagues, and it's because all Apostles have their fixations. And this is especially true for the Hawk. That's why someday, I want to kill him. Salat utilizes his Yurumi to attack Roxas. In the exchange, Salat slices the Apostle with a small dagger concealed between his toes. Those blades are done cutting. Roxas is impressed by Salat's improved skills. Salat was humbled by Guts, which forced him to train every day in improving his skills. The fireworks go out, but the Tapasa come in with Rickert's water cannon, except it's been rigged to shoot fire. The flames head straight towards Roxas and envelop his entire body. Roxas enters his apostle form, shocking Rickert and his crew. Roxas snatches up a horse, raises him above his head, and splits him open, utilizing the blood to douse out the fire. Erica runs towards Rickert, so Roxas grabs the girl and raises her into the air. Erica! screams Rickert. Fire, not out yet. It burns. Extinguish. Snakes start crawling over Roxas' body. He releases the girl, and she falls into Daiba's arms. A person in mid-air? Says Rickert. Now I've bid you back, boy. Daiba wants to travel with Salat and the Baki Raka back to their homeland. Salat asks Rickert, their leader, what he thinks about the proposition. The boy has no qualms about this, but right now, they still have an adversary they have to beat. Daiba summons snakes and rats to attack Roxas. Erica jumps into Rickert's arms as Daiba prepares their ride. Ah! Three Garuda emerge from the barn, ready to take flight. The escapees board the Garuda as Daiba tosses Luca a bag of diamonds for all her kindness. Roxas gives chase in his apostle form. I'll be damned! That old rag can fly! Rickard loads up a small cannon, blasting it directly into Roxas and causing him to fall down to the ground. Take care, everyone, says Luca. Griffith stares up at Rickert as the boy briefly glances back at him. On the seahorse, Istro points out Skellig Island. Guts and the others are thrilled to have finally made it there. The Black Swordsman proceeds to thank Shirka and the others for all their help. Istro inquires Puck as to why he left his homeland. Long ago, Puck fought Jonah, the seagull boss. But when hunger and boredom set in, he hopped on the seagull's back and went back home. Unfortunately, he pissed on the bird's back and he was thusly tossed off. And from there, he embarked on a journey called life. And that was the prologue of Berserk. Isma's mother hands the girl a shell in which she can communicate with her. The mother tells everyone that the flow of time is different on the island compared to the outside world. Shirka has heard of this phenomena before, stating that several decades can go by in the real world if one spends too much time on the island. Therefore, they can't spend too much time here. Magnifico reminds Puck about their deal, but the elf has already forgotten about it. The crew enters a field that appears to be filled with gravestones. Shirka explains that this is, in fact, a barrier to keep trespassers away. The island originally existed within the astral world, but ever since the wind blew through, it is now overlapping with the physical realm. Shirka ties a string around Puck to have him navigate the maze as the others follow along. In the trees, a group of mages watches on, saying that the scarecrows should scare them off. As Istro inspects a pumpkin, a scarecrow comes alive and startles him. The boy runs away as Guts hacks into the scarecrow. A horde of scarecrows bear down on the group. Istro dodges an attack. He then turns the tables with his salamander dagger. Azan and Guts enter the fray as Roderick's men protect the women. The concealed mages use a spell to bring the pumpkins alive. It's a little early for a harvest festival, says Guts. The black swordsman hacks through the monsters as the others help in their own ways. Shirka manipulates the spell cast on the field, enhancing the ripening workings of the earth spirits. You're too easy on them, says a fourth mage to the other three. A flaming wicker man then blocks their path. Shirka explains that this fetish utilizes the life force of sacrifices with ancient magic. The other mages tell Morda that the wicker man is a taboo magic. So what if it's taboo? It exists for times like this. Its potential is wasted as a mere decoration. What good is a puppet if you don't play with it? Guts dodges the Wicker Man's attacks. He then fires the cannon into the magical being, causing it to fall down. Guts then slices through its head with his sword, subsequently releasing the souls trapped within. The crew plans to run away with the fire spreading, but Morda won't allow them to escape. She then wonders why a magic user and elves are in their party. The other mages intervene as an old mage, Gedfring, alters the weather to make it rain and put out the fires. 
The other mages refer to Gedfring as Guru, and he governs the mages of this island. He then says, An old friend came to see me in a dream, and said to look after my dearest little student when she visits. Shirka realizes that this must have been her mistress, Flora. Gedfring then guides them back to the village to meet with the elfin ruler. Shirka informs the other mages that they're here to restore Casca's memories. Kuka states that the flower store monarch can possibly repair the mind via the corridor of dreams. This news makes Guts very happy. Gedfring states that the disturbance that changed everything was the great roar of the astral world, which was precipitated by the Hawk of Light. But he'll discuss this in further detail in the village. There lies Flower Storm Monarch's Elf Helm. The crew is flabbergasted by what they are seeing. The houses resemble the one that Flora lived in with Shirka. The mages here hone their magical skills on a daily basis. Morta claims it's all boring though, and she wants to leave the island and explore the real world. She then inquires about the outside world from Shirka. Istro aims to prank the mages, but they end up pummeling him instead. Now then, first, stop by my hall, says Gedfring. The crew enters the massive tree. They encounter a group of older mages playing a game of chess. Don and the domestic introduces the three mages. They are all great gurus who govern the mages of the village. Donna aims to make tea, but Guts wishes to meet with the Flower Storm Monarch as soon as possible. Gedfring urges Guts to exercise patience, whilst the others help themselves to Don and sweet treats. Okay. Serpico says that things are a bit disorienting now, given the calamity of events that they went through to get here today. The group sits around a circular table as Donnan serves them soup. While the other mages are terrified of the outside world, Morda thinks it sounds thrilling. Gedfring asks the gang if they've seen the branches that stretch through the sky. Those branches connect to the world tree, and legend says it connects to the heavens, the earth, and the underworld. It's literally a massive fissure that penetrates the world, piercing deep into the layers of the physical and astral worlds. On rare occasions, like a full moon, paths connect the physical and astral realms. Small ones are called the elfin path, and occasionally, children will get lost on them. Large ones are called the dragon path, and they reach into the astral world. That egg at your side is a fetish for opening the dragon path deep into the abyss. Gedfring wonders if the egg belongs to Guts, or if he's merely carrying it. Puck then takes the bailet, claiming it's his. The gurus state that the large trees connected to the world tree are parasitic, and by absorbing power from the world tree, they hinder the expansion of its branches into the physical realm. Mages, on the other hand, maintain the balance between the physical and astral realms. The forest of the world tree is almost entirely ashes, so the world tree has grown rampant. Gedfring inquires about the Hawk of Light. He'll have his own kingdom, says Guts. Gedfring states that the Hawk of Light has restored an ancient metropolis. It's ironic though that at the foot of the tree is the Eye of the Storm. In fact, it's the only place where people can live in peace and prosperity. I've had more than my fair share of surprises thus far, but to think your nemesis is capable of changing the world? That defies all imagination. Fernice is surprised to hear this as Magnifico wants to check further into the situation. Istro is shocked to find out that Guts and the Hawk previously knew each other. The mages are taken aback at how far Griffith will go to attain his own kingdom. Getting his kingdom, that's just one step along his way. He'll continue soaring higher and higher. That's Griffith, the Hawk. The group enters the forest, with Istro noting that his body feels lighter. This is due to the lack of weight elementals, weight bariots as they're called. Though they can't be seen, if gathered together, they make objects heavy, darken the sky, and produce depression and obsession of the mind. Isma notices that her body feels lighter too. As the group walks through the forest, various magical creatures come out and watch on. The magical creatures quickly surround the group, growing rather fond of them. Isma and Istro land on a pair of unicorns. This is chaos, says Shirka. That's the way it is with elves, replies Kuka. Donnan proceeds to blow a horn and instructs the magical creatures to go home. The group then reaches an enormous tree that houses the Corridor of Dreams.
They enter through a hollow, discovering that the inside looks like a maze. Magnifico reminds Puck about their deal. The group reaches a large chamber, with an opening to the outside. The magical creatures play various instruments to mark the arrival of their leader. So what kind of leader does Puck have anyway? Says Isidro. <laughs> Elf King hath arrived! Lower your heads! Magnifico's plan of developing a market for elves is blowing up in his face. You sold the kingdoms to humans? Says the creature. Yes, replies Puck. That's treason! Manihiko, my loyal retainer! Your plan to overthrow the kingdom was crushed! See you in Valhalla! Damn, it feels good to be a gangster. Perhaps contact with the outside world has corrupted you, says Donnan. She then goes through a magical transformation. One that surprises everyone in the room. Welcome to Elfhelm, travelers. The group is stunned to see Donnan as the Flower Storm Monarch. Shirka feels an extraordinary spiritual pressure that is warm and comforting. Guts is eager to make his request. But first, Donnan wants to punish the troublemakers. Puck wants to be the king of idle living. But that's what he already does. And Donnan as king, works diligently to maintain a state of order. Puck pledges allegiance to Donnan, but it's to no avail, as Donnan sentences Magnifico and Puck to assist the Brownies for the rest of the day. With this out of the way, Donnan states that she's aware of Guts' tale, and how he wants to restore Casca's memories. Y you can do that? If we use the Corridor of Dreams, most likely. Everyone is happy for Guts. Donnan decides to skip the welcome banquet and invites Farnese and Shirka to accompany Casca to the Corridor of Dreams. Guts wants to come too, but Donnan declines, sensing a strong sense of fear from Casca that would hinder the ritual. Though Guts is disappointed, he places his trust in the two mages to take care of Casca for him. Guts and the crew leave the area as Donnan escorts the two to the Corridor of Dreams. Donnan explains the lantern into Casca's dreams and decipher the clues and formulate a solution. Do bear one thing in mind though. You could say dreams are part of the astral world, but the rules therein stem from the mind of the dreamer. The first thing you must do is uncover the rules. The three step on the magic mushroom beds and are instructed to relax and breathe slowly. Donnan tells them to go on their way as they all doze into sleep. We then see Shirka eating some honey as she's caught by Isidro. The witch summons a golem and the wheel of flame, but the Isidro monkey stomps it down. Wait! This is my dream! Shirka then exits through a small opening. Meanwhile, Farnese does the laundry with the Mosca's washing stone. That just leaves you, Guts. I'm in your hands. As she hangs the laundry, Shirka grabs her hand and says they need to get going to Casca's dream. The two enter Casca's dream. This is Casca's? This is me, says Farnese. This is a typical dream of hers, within her shallow consciousness, says Shirka. We'll have to dive deeper. Donnan's petals guide him to a deeper level of Casca's psyche. The two mages enter a vast wasteland with a black sun. Shirka wonders what could have happened for her psyche to resemble such a horrific landscape. The two search for Casca, but spot a dog dragging a casket by a chain. The dog has been impaled multiple times and is missing its left front leg. Shirka notices that the band of the hawk crest is on the casket as flying creatures start attacking the dog. The two mages drive the creatures off. Shirka then removes the stick-like objects from the dog. Look, it's the... This is Guts, as he exists in this world. The two then open the casket, only to find a shattered doll inside. <laughs> I'm sure of it. This is Casca. Inside the doll's chest is a fragment of Casca's self. The small version of Casca leaps into Farnese's hand and plays around a bit. Farnese places a small Casca back inside the doll for the time being. From this point forward, they'll follow the guidance and attempt to unravel the mystery.
Outside, the elves and humans engage in a celebration. Isidro and Isma seem to be drunk, cause yeah, it's a party! As Magnifico and Puck are put to work. Roderick and Serpco bring Guts some refreshments. This journey has changed Guts for the better, teaching him to accept help from others. I'd like to thank you. Serpco speaks of his experiences with Lady Farnese, and how Guts changed everything for her with a destructive spark. You breathe life into Lady Farnese. Serpco wanted to murder Guts at first, and several times, but seeing Farnese stand on her own two feet was comforting for him, and protecting Casca has given her strength to rise to the task. Guts is reminded of Skull Knight's words once more as we transition back to the two mages. After following the petals for some time, they come upon a campfire. This is a scrap of Casca's memories, says Shirka. Campfire of dreams, huh? You smooth talker. You sound like some princess. The two experience a bittersweet feeling, generated from Casca's past experiences. A piece of the doll repairs itself, meaning if they find the rest of Casca's scattered memories, they'll bring back the old Casca. Shadowy monsters impede their path, so Shirka summons the golem and the flame wheel to fend him off. The two come across a sword and a helmet. They see Guts engaged in a battle with Casca, making them wonder if they were enemies. Another fragment is added to the doll as they move forward. The memory of when the Band of the Hawk took Doldry Castle is played. Casca's first encounter with Griffith is shown. It feels like a blow to the head. It's similar to how I felt about Guts. Spider-like monsters approach them, but Shirka deploys multiple golems to subdue them. They come upon a chandelier, eliciting the memory from when the Band of the Hawk was celebrated for their victory against the Tudor army. They then encounter a cave. Frustration aimed at guts and jealousy. The two find a broken sword, showing the second battle between Guts and Griffith. Helplessly unable to come between them, sorrow enough to rend her heart in two, and this feeling welling up as she stares at his back. I knew it. Shirka summons Lady of the Depths to fight off the numerous hairballs. A waterfall from the sky shows Guts and Casca fighting each other. Mistress, you mustn't look! Huh? But for scholarly reference! Sure enough, this is how it is. No, I've known this from the start. The two continue collecting Casca's fragmented memories. The two wonder how much time has passed inside Casca's dream as they draw near to the pincushion in the distance. The area is covered in a dense miasma, symbolizing the event that shattered her mind. Farnese checks in on Casca's self. Mistress, She's saying something. There's someone I want to see, says Casca. I'm sure we'll make it happen, because it's what he wished for. The two walk through a forest of corpses and thorn cedars. The petals are leading them to the mountain as they proceed forward. The guts dog begins barking as a group of enormous insects emerge from the forest. Upon closer inspection, their mouths seem to resemble Conrad's from the God Hand. Shirka summons Lady of the Depths and the golems to fend him off once more. The creatures, nonetheless, surround them. Shirka finds a tree root and thusly calls upon the rotting root lord. Now, wheel the flame, clear a path! Phallic-shaped monsters block their way. The golems manhandle them, but the two mages are exhausted from the repeated battles. Two more phallic monsters chase them down, but Shirka's out of magical fetishes. Farnese then summons the stone head of Mosgus. Swift is heaven's vengeance! God press! The golems push the casket as the sharp branches obstruct their path. It's as if the dream is trying to obstruct us, to keep from waking up. Upon exiting the forest, the two stare up at the black sun, as well as a field of thorns and a cryptic egg that is glowing from the inside. That's the final fragment. As they peer at the final fragment, a large, caligonous bird comes swooping in. It's the guardian of the final fragment, the mightiest, the king of monsters in this dream. 
The guts dog goes berserk at the sight of this bird. Shirka summons a golem fetish, but the bird tears through it with its talons. The miasma it spread is assuming some kind of a shape. The monsters resemble the one seen at the eclipse, causing Casca to tremble in fear. I saw this before, in Guts' memories. Shirka henceforth summons all her fetishes at once. We must break through here and reach the fragment. The two mages push their way through the thorn-covered vines, but the caligonous bird comes swooping in again. The bird grabs Guts and the casket. It then releases both in mid-air. This could work! Get going, Serpico! Serpico's cloak breaks their fall. My, my, you are a slave driver, Lady Farnese. The bird sweeps in and gashes the gut's dog. The miasma spreads around the casket, but then the berserker armor flies from Farnese's bag to the gut's dog. <laughs> The two mages head towards the casket, as the bird challenges Guts once more. The mages utilize Serpco and the golems to carry the casket to its final destination. We're out of protective measures! Suddenly, cherry blossoms rain on their heads as Donnan's voice comes through. One yet remains, within the memories you've cherished all along. M mistress Now I must bestow a blessing upon my dearest student. Flora's body is enveloped by a great flame, and she uses it to incinerate the monsters. They finally reach their destination. Farnese places the Mosgus fetish underneath the casket to raise it up to the egg-like structure. Inside rests the glowing demon child. The two are shocked that the last fragment is a child. Shirka caught a glimpse of what they are about to see when she was within guts, so she warns Farnese to keep her mind well guarded. <laughs> final fragment is a heart. However, the heart carries an ananthema, a curse, if you will, to protect herself from the painful past. Shirko recalls Skull Knight's words on the beach. This is what he meant. The caligonous bird peers in. It begins to attack, but Guts lunges in and bites on him. The two ferociously go back and forth, giving the mages a small window to put the heart back into the doll. Farnese empathizes with Casca's self. There are times when you cower, unable to move. That's why, like he did for me, this time, for your own reasons, I'm going to drive away your darkness. The bird bears down on them once more, so Shirka constructs Farnese to hurry up. Farnese returns the heart to the proper location, making the bird disappear in front of their eyes. Casca's self opens up a small door. 
I'm sure you'll get to see him. The Guts dog begins to howl as a bright light shines down on them with a myriad of cherry blossoms. Welcome back everyone. You did well on your long journey. Though it felt like months and possibly years, only one day passed while the mages were inside Casca. I remember each of you. That girl, Elaine. Everything she saw and felt now rest within me. It's good to meet you, Farnese, Shirka, Ivalera. Thank you for taking care of me as Elaine for so long. Shirka notices that the strength and color of Casca's OD is completely different. It's like they're two different people. Up until now, Casca was dreaming through Elaine. She had no thoughts or feelings. She just merely observed from a distant darkness. To Casca, it's like a dream has appeared in reality. But Shirka assures her that this is real. Though Casca remembers setting out to save Griffith, everything else after that is muddled. Do you remember Guts? <laughs> Donnan offers a small gift to Casca so that she can reunite with Guts in a formal attire. A flowing, floral dress appears on her figure. Now be on your way. I just notified the swordsman using telepathy. Casca steps outside. With each step I take, I recall them vividly. Those sad, beloved days. The evidence that I am Casca. And the days when I was Elaine, unable to think or feel, looking up from below the water's surface. And yet, deep within me, there was a faint voice. Elsewhere, we see desecrated remains of several humans. Griffith's war demons prepare for battle against the Jotnor tribe. Lord Griffith, the heart of the enemy's will is east of the battlefield, atop a hill. But be careful, an ominous shadow lurks in the grave behind the hill. Griffith confronts the Jotnor King head-on. A Hydra is released to keep the band of the Hawk at bay, but Zod leaps forward and bites down on the Hydra's head. Or at least one of its heads.
I've slain the king of the Jatnor. Sonia, convey what I'm seeing. Griffith declares victory, instructing his men to finish off the enemy. After the bloodbath, all that remains is a vast wasteland of corpses. Griffith gathers up the lost souls, so that they may see their loved ones once more. Laban reminds Mule that although they captured this new territory, maintaining it is a whole nother issue. Griffith leads the army to a touchstone. Grunbeld arranges the stone pillars so that they can walk through. Griffith then instructs the war demons to revert to their humanoid forms as they go through the pillars. Sonya quips that they'd get stuck in their apostle forms if they didn't do this. As they walk through, they are transported to the branches of the World Spiral Tree. We are now galloping through the branches of the World Twin Tree. Laban and Mule are surprised by what they are witnessing. Being with Lord Griffith means having a part in a legend, says Sonya. Sonya reminds them that only Griffith and herself can navigate the vast network of branches due to their special abilities. Yet, a march led by Griffith could save them considerable time in future military endeavors. The Band of the Hawk makes a return as we see numerous wilted trees outside of Falconia. Inside Falconia, various military officials and dignitaries discuss legislative issues. Locus informs the council that the marooding giants have been eliminated by the heavy cavalry. With land being reclaimed, Griffith now wants to focus on human prosperity. Owen reports that several people are underpaid in the migrant community, and this is leading to high rates of crime. Given a myriad of circumstances, it's possible a civil war could break out. The only immediate action is to increase military personnel. Charlotte puts forward a proposal to fund an orphanage. Because of the war with the Kushans, the economy collapsed. So they don't have the means to fund such a project. No, we should do it. Griffith suggests they use part of the treasure that they recover from the giants to cover the cost. In order for us to survive, we must prosper. Griffith wants to educate all the children until the age of 10, along with teaching them solidarity and belonging. The nobles are weary about educating the common folk, yet Griffith informs them that they'll need several advances in technology, agriculture, and food distribution if they hope to prosper. The nobles, however, worry how to deal with the financial strain. Griffith recommends that they take the refugees into the army, allowing them to build their own wealth. The military would also be responsible for engineering projects, like building roads, cities, and even a wall. A wall. And 10 years of military service would grant them citizenship. Griffith wants to emulate Geyseric's kingdom in expanding their territory and establishing a second empire. The nobles still fret over financial issues. However, Foss reminds them that a grand fantasy is often essential in attaining a great dream. Charlotte meets with Griffith after the meeting, much to Sonia's disgust. Charlotte wants to plant flowers at the orphanage. You're like the kingdom's mother, says Griffith. You are like the father of the kingdom, perhaps even the king. Charlotte invites Griffith for tea. Sonia attempts to invite herself, but Mule holds her back. She then storms off in anger. <laughs> Of course, then this night will be... Donna gives Casca a haircut. She also gives her clothing more suited to her taste. And, of course, a matching sword. This is much better. Don't stare, you're making it awkward. Casca then thinks of the girls at the Holy Grounds, and hopes that she'll have a chance to thank them one day. Casca likens Farnese to a mother or a big sister, making the girl cry with joy. Casca thanks Shirka as well. Istro marvels at her sword a bit, wondering if she's any good. I wonder. I think I've gotten pretty rusty. I can feel the weight of the sword a bit. Donnie calls upon some Viking golems for Casca to spar with. She blocks the first Viking strike, whacks it in the head, and lops off its right foot. The onlookers marvel on at her skill as she handily subdues the other two Vikings. Istro asks to spar with Casca, bowing his head in gratitude. So you have learned to bow your head, my young Padawan? The two go at each other with Farnese and Shirka checking in on Guts. The Black Swordsman doesn't wish to approach Casca at this moment. Donnan says that time and faded bonds will eventually heal her. Farnese wants Casca to see Guts right away. She thusly encourages Casca to see him right now. Casca approaches Guts, admiring the group of friends he's made in his travels. She's astonished that Guts would take on Istro as a ward, but he knows his way around fighting with two blades, just like Judo. Thank <laughs> you.
But she still can't see him. A distraught Guts removes himself from the situation. Meanwhile, the Knight of Skeleton views the proceedings from a concealed location. Casca takes it easy in bed. She then thinks of Guts' face and voice, causing her to become extremely nauseous. Farnese heads out for her studies, but Casca instinctively grabs her hand. The two mages attend Gedfring's class. Farnese is asked to demonstrate her magic, but the other mages mock her inexperience. Farnese summons the array of the four cardinal points, shocking everyone in the vicinity. She tells Gedfring she's only been practicing magic for about three months. The other mages state that it took them years to master such a spell. Gedfring calls Shirka forward to demonstrate her magical art. The young witch enters her luminous body and travels to the hollow of a tree. I am a nameless shadow, a gaping dark. The gloomy girl's wish. This I grant. Bring one fruit to staff. The spirit of darkness frightens the other mages. Nicely done. Kuka wonders how Shirka can perform magic without a magical circle. Shirka explains that she forms the links in her mind. This happened because she was placed in situations where time was of the essence, and drawing a magical circle was not an option. Gedfring is blown away by their experiences. He encourages the other mages to form connections with the outside world. Farnese makes a request. Would you not bestow us with magics of healing? Gedfring confesses that one mage is particularly adept in healing the mind. Danin shows up and henceforth takes Farnese under her wing. Gedfring then queries Shirka about her interest in mingling minds with a daemon, which are spirits that reside in a deeper realm. The daemon do not belong solely to the hereafter. In life, there were human heroes and sorcerers among them. Shirka realizes that she could summon her old mistress, Flora, if she mastered such a spell. Elsewhere, Gut swings his sword on a nearby cliff. He thinks about his past circumstances with Casca, wondering how he should proceed. You bear witness to the end of your journey. It is not always a happy thing. Oh, it's you says Guts, as dictated by causality. Guts flaunts his ability to still use his senses, despite his numerous life-threatening battles. Skull Knight gives him congratulations. However, do not let your guard falter. Causality has yet to converge. Before Guts has a chance to ask what this means, Gedfring intrudes. It has been a long time, your majesty. Skull Knight recognizes him as the son of Vid. Guts then wonders how old Gedfring and Skull Knight are. Gedfring invites Guts and the Skull Knight to visit Hanar, who's a dwarf, spirit of smithing, and a skilled craftsman. Your armor and Sir Skull Knight's are both products of his prowess. Meanwhile, Shirka practices flying a broom. Morda hops on the backside and says, You'll pick it up much quicker if someone actually flies, you know. Shirka freaks out whilst they fly through the air. Morda accelerates, causing Shirka to clench her teeth. Morda is one of the best broom riders on the island, and she's a bit of a delinquent. The two notice Guts, Skull Knight, and Gedfring in a ravine, so they decide to descend and investigate. Shirka quickly notices that the land feels much like Quithoth, Quithoth being the place they visited when they were at Morgan's village. Elfhelm was once attacked by a great kingdom, and the captured enemy soldiers were sacrificed to create wicker men. Sorcerers and witches used to be measured by the amount of fear they instilled, but that's all changed now. The two encounter Granny Volvapa, Morda's master. Volvapa is a master of curses and the manipulation of departed souls. She directs them to the stone forest to find guts. Volvapa wages that the arrival of the Skull Knight and Flora student is proof positive that the Guru's prognostications are coming true. The two then come upon Guts and the gang. Hanar wonders why a sorcerer would come to the bowels of the earth, as Guts is immediately reminded of Godo. Hanar acknowledges the king. It is thanks to you that I am in good health, says Skull Knight. Good health, eh? Bah! You're just rotting in your coffin. Hanar is shocked to see Guts in the Berserker armor. Guts thanks him for the armor, but Hanar reminds him that it doesn't mean he's mastered it yet, and it is still liable to possess him and consume him. Well then, let's give it a go. <laughs>
Guts halts moving for a moment, so Shirka utilizes his time to pry the hood off of Guts' head. Guts thanks Shirka before saying, That right now, that was for sure the end. What you bore witness to was the end of a foolish king, and the beginning of a dead man stalking the endless night. Skull Knight enters a tree hollow as Guts wonders if they are the same. No doubt about it, that was the eclipse. This is a mausoleum for the Skull Knight's beloved. Donnan refers to the Skull Knight's beloved as the Lady Priestess of Cherry Blossoms. Shirka and Guts notice that Donnan is the spinning image of the Lady Priestess. I am a portent of doom, the remnant of a grudge. My aim is ever singular. I have not the heart to bathe in the lambency of my mortal days. Shirka wonders what kind of connection Skull Knight and Flora had. In her youth, Flora served under the Lady Priestess of Cherry Blossoms. Unfortunately, her feelings were too uh, strong, and after the calamitous events of the Eclipse, she violated a taboo and was thusly exiled from the village. Ivalera then grabs Shirka to take care of the monkey, and the monkey being Isidro. Isidro takes the opportunity to goof on the mages. Because you put me through hell, now you will dance, as pathetic and hilarious as the rest of them. Istro tosses elf bullets at the mages. He proceeds to swoop down and wrap the mages' cloaks around their heads, revealing their underwear. The mages' panic is more to laughs than their humiliation. You're the only one left, Shirka. I'll see you howl and weep, and your pumpkin panties will be exposed. That's a refreshingly sleazy baggy face. Morta finds Isidro's antics amusing as the boy stares at her boobs. Shirka mounts a resistance, but no laws bind the monkey man. Vulgar greatness! A Kelpie swallows Isidro as Isma thinks they're playing a game of tag. The Kelpie spits out Isidro as Shirka wonders once more about her mistress and what taboo she could have broken to be banished from the island. Under the moonlight, Gedfring asks Guts about his relationship with the Skull Knight. The mage states that Skull Knight is driven by an endless rage. He is fascinated with Guts because they are so alike. Gedfring offers a warning for the Black Swordsman. In the end, you must determine what to make of your fury, whether it is to be the breath that keeps you alive or the hellfire that consumes you from within. Guts peers at Casca, wondering what he'll do. He then swings his sword deep into the night. As he pauses to think of Griffith, the wind blows. Cherry blossoms fall from the trees, and a mysterious person approaches him from the shadows. Why are you here? says Guts. The boy climbs on the Guts' back. Guts proceeds to go back inside to show the others the boy. Shirka still thinks the boy is the Flower Storm Monarch, but when Donnan dispels this notion, the others give her a hard time. Mind taking him up to Casca for me? says Guts. As soon as they bring the boy to Casca, he jumps into the bed to hug her. Casca remembers the boy, particularly the fact that he always came on full moons. Shirka explains to Donnan that on such nights, he would appear before them and disappear before the dawn. Donnan was aware of their expedition, but that was due to a dream from Flora, not the Moonlight Boy. Donnan notes that the boy's OD is pure, like a fairy, and it's because of the island's fate that he was guided here. And the island's fate includes everyone who lives on it. Because they've been taken in by everyone, their fate is also intertwined with the island. Donnan notes that Casca and Guts both have a strong connection with the boy. Guts stares up at the moon as Casca sleeps with the boy. In the morning time, everyone wonders why the boy is still with them, because the full moon is now gone. That's because the flow of time on the island is muddled at best. Casca, henceforth, utilizes this time to have the boy play outside with the mages and various golems. The gurus are surprised that the boy exudes no malice and has caused the elves and spirits to become quite attached to him. The group spends the afternoon catching fish, eating, and frolicking around. Casca and the boy look like mother and child. Serpco says it feels like they're family at this point. Family, but... Guts swings his sword by a waterfall, but he loses his grip, and the sword falls into the water. His hand visibly shakes, so he tosses a small dagger at an apple. Unfortunately, he misses, which is very uncharacteristic of Guts. Still can't do it without this guy, huh? 
The Moonlight Boy sticks his head out from inside the armor. He walks around a bit and even pretends a twig is a sword. You're a knight now? The two have an entertaining swords fight as Guts pats the boy on the head as if he were his own son. Guts removes the Berserker armor and instructs the boy to hang out with the others. Being like this feels natural. I remember feeling something nostalgic then, ever since I met him on that moonlight beach. No, as Elaine, I knew him even before then. Affection, sorrow, but where? Casca wakes up with an epiphany. She looks outside her window, seeing Guts and the Moonlight Boy on the grass. Guts stares at the boy with astonishment as Casca runs outside as fast as she can. I had a dream. Under the full moon, I was a child embraced by nostalgic warmth. But when I wake up from the dream, only a vague sense of longing remains. That too will soon disappear, with a single tear like the morning dew. And with that guys, that ends chapter 364 of the Berserk manga and this timeline video. Now, a lot of you are probably wondering when is the story going to be continued? Because when I did the timeline last year, I ended with chapter 363. And in one year time, only one chapter has been added. Well, as most of you know, but maybe not everyone, Kentaro Mira, the mangaka for Berserk, passed away on May 6th of 2021. We found out about this news on May 20th, and the community showed their support by saying thank you Kentaro Mira, plenty of videos, lots of support, dedication, love. Yeah, but unfortunately, he is no longer with us at this point in time. And um, this last chapter, 364, came out in September of last year. A uh, young animal and his assistants ended up finishing it from his manuscripts. And after this page on the manga, young animal wrote a statement about the potential future of Berserk. And uh, I'll read it for you guys. So, for all the fans of Kentaro Mira, we would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our Berserk readers for your continued support. The Berserk Chapter 364 published in this volume is the last work of the late Kentaro Mira. We were able to carry on the manuscript left behind and publish this time thanks to the dedicated support of Studio Gaga, who worked on Berserk together with Kentaro Mira over the years. Also, we are delighted to announce the latest release of this comic book this December. We thank all the readers for waiting such a long time, especially in the circumstance where the information was unclear and ambiguous. This volume also serves as a special memorial to Kentaro Mira as his last manuscript. We decided to use his ink sketch for this cover specifically this time, hoping to convey to all the readers all his passion, which is so strong and fully perceivable even from the ink sketches. We hope that you will feel the devotion that he put into his work, in creating this volume, we've grown deeply aware of how big and powerful Berserk was to us, just like Guts' mighty iron sword. We are deeply sorry to inform you that there is no information to share about the future of Berserk at this time. One thing we can promise you is that as Young Animal, the publisher that has worked with Kentaro Mira on Berserk, our first priority will always be placed on him. What would he think if he were still with us? Last but not least, we have a message from all the fans from Japan and overseas. We have read all the letters that have been sent with great appreciation. We would like to express our gratitude to you once again for your continued love and support. Sincerely, Young Animal Editing Department. So as you can see, it's rather ambiguous, so it's sort of hard to determine where Berserk is going to go in the future. But, um... Yeah, that's all I got for you guys. I hope you enjoyed this remastered timeline. If you can, support the channel through Patreon, Subscribestar, or just like and watch the video. And uh, yeah, I'll catch you guys on the flip side. Thanks again.